Okay, hi everybody. It's David Wildstein. I'm the editor of the New Jersey Globe. Uh, we are here on one of my favorite days of the year. It is filing day. It, today is the last day to get on the ballot for the uh, June Democratic and Republican primaries in New Jersey. Except, and, and there's always an except in New Jersey, uh, and that is unless some judge says uh, the laws are fungible and we're going to make a change. But I think I think we're pretty much set where we are. Uh, I'm joined by Micah Rasmussen, who is the director of the Rebovich Institute of New Jersey Politics at Ryder University, and Joey Fox, political reporter of NewJerseyGlobe.com, who spent most of his day uh, at the State Division of Elections uh, as people were coming with their petitions. So, Joey, if you have some opening thoughts, why don't we start with you? I mean, my opening thoughts are that I, I went there, I went to the Division of Elections in part to see whether there would be any big last minute surprise filings. And there weren't for the most part. There was one that I was, I was, um, I was definitely caught off guard by and we'll get to that pretty late on. It's in District 27. But re regardless, for the most part, not anything super surprising. And what that means is for the most part, we are not seeing a ton of competitive primaries. And that's not necessarily outside the norm for New Jersey, where the parties are super strong and their choices for lower level offices, including state legislature, oftentimes can, can get by uh, without much competition. So that's what we're seeing in a majority of districts here. That's gonna be a theme that I think we're gonna hit on over and over tonight. We're gonna look at these districts, we're gonna talk about who the candidates are and what the import is. But in most cases, we'll basically be talking about November because the people who have filed are the only ones who have filed for their seats on both, both sides of the aisle. And, and we're looking at November matchups already established in March. So, so that's sort of the crux of my opening thought here is we're going to have a few races that are going to be really interesting in June, three, four, 24, 26, 27, a couple others that I'm missing. But really, a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is these are the people who are we going to, we're going to still be talking about in October and November. Michael, let me let you start with something. Yeah, I'll continue with Joey's thought, which is that... Um, that's why this is such a consequential day. This is not just setting up June. This is setting up November. And this tells us how competitive the entire cycle is going to be based on who has decided to run. Has each party recruited its A team? Or are we looking at a B team or a C team? And, um, you know, Joey and I have talked about this a lot, and David and I as well. Who you pick and who decides to run determines how competitive these races are and how these races are going to be. And that determines, you know, recruitment determines competitiveness and then competitiveness determines recruitment. So the flip side of this is we're not only looking at how competitive the races are, but how the candidates view these races to the extent that they chose to run that determines how much of a chance they think they've got to, uh, you know, for over the next over the next eight months. So um, it's uh, it's a consequential day. It's one of the most consequential days of the year electorally. I'll tell you one thing that I have seen this cycle uh, to to a level that I've never witnessed before is the difficulty by both parties to recruit candidates. Uh, we are clearly at a time, whether it's in New Jersey and our nation, where where a lot of people don't want to run for office. Right. And, and I kept getting, as I talked to people about candidate recruitment over the last few months, uh, people were getting a lot of no's. Yeah. It's, it's harder. Maybe that's one of the reasons we don't have as many primaries, but it's tough to run for office. It's tough, I think, because of the climate we're in, because of the polarization between parties, be, because people... Uh, people don't want to have, you know, they, they don't want to take on the good fight and then have problems in their own neighborhood. They don't want their kids to come home from school and talk about about what they heard about their, their mother or their father running for office. Uh, uh, they don't want to be trolled on the Internet. Uh, and I think that I think this might be a harbinger of a bigger problem for democracy uh, as, as we see. And, and, and I haven't had a chance to look at all the local candidates, you know, and I'm not taking anything away uh, from the men and women that filed this year. But if we're going to get to a point where parties are only able to get uh, second or third tier people to run for office, then that's really frightening. Uh, for both parties, for Democrats, for Republicans, for conservatives, for progressives, for people in the middle, uh, that that if you're only having 
second or third tier minds running for office, then that's who's going to be governing. Uh, and, you know, I think that's a problem. The first, go ahead. Go, sorry. Go ahead. That's fine. No, I was going to say maybe another symptom of that or part and parcel of that is how many retirements we're seeing this year. How many incumbents have chosen not to run for reelection? It's the highest in 16 years. It's the highest since 2007. So before we before we start going through through the state and, and as is our tradition, uh, it will we'll start in the south and head head north, sort of a tribute to, to Vineland's own Mike Erasmusen. Uh, but but this map. That we we got on a little over a year ago. We came on one of these live streams and went through the map and talked about how competitive it was and how Republicans had a chance to uh, that, that there was a path, a narrow path, to take control of the legislature. But but it it's increasingly looking that this map, uh, while fairer than others, not as competitive as some people thought it would be. Did, mm -hmm. Mike, do you agree with that? I do. Yeah, I think um, we were excited about a number of districts that we thought might pan out. We, we thought, uh, you know, we thought that District 8 might be hotter. We thought that, um, yeah, we thought that this could attract some new people to the process. If we want to look at recruitment as a measure of that, it doesn't look like it brought a lot of people out of the woodwork. It doesn't look like it brought anybody additional to the table. There are exceptions. You know, there are hot spots. The fourth district, we've known that was going to be hot in Gloucester County, and it did bring a number of teams out of the woodwork. District three, obviously. So, um, you know, there are some spots, but those are the exception to the rule. Joey, is this a competitive map? Can Republicans win control? I mean, this is as competitive of a map as it was a year ago. I don't think that today's filing day has is all that reflective of the map. It's more that, you know, the map itself kind of got a bunch of takes, including from us, that like, okay, well, if you if you add up the math in this particular way, then sure, you can get to this very competitive result. Or you could get to a democratic landslide. I mean, there, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of swinginess built into it, but that swinginess is in large part dependent on having not just candidates who can take advantage of it, but candidates who the parties want to invest in and, and want to see succeed. And you don't have all that many districts where that is looking like the case. And one thing I do want to push back on something that you both said before, which is about these sort of second and third tier candidates on one hand. Yes. I think that, um, I think that when you have parties reaching out to potential candidates and they say no, that is a sign of something troubling, that what is supposed to be this great honor of serving in public life is maybe not perceived as much, quite like that. But it's also, I think, that the idea of dismissing the people who are the backup options as necessarily inferior as potential legislators is not necessarily right. I mean, you could see like people who are coming from different angles who are not necessarily the party's first choices um, could end up being, there, there's all kinds of things we don't know. We don't know how that, how good some of these people will be as candidates. We don't know how good they might be as legislators. So I think that approaching that with something of an open mind is probably healthy for us right now. It's a good, it's a good point. And, you know, I mean, I guess what I'm looking for in terms of what kind of a tier you put them in, and we can only speculate tonight, but with some of the newcomers, but how much experience do they have, not as a legislator right now, but how much experience do they have in running a competitive race? Or do people, do they have around them who know how to run a competitive race and a competitive campaign? Joey, you and I talked about this earlier on with Sam Thompson. Um, is there somebody around him who, and of course, obviously he's chosen since then not to run, but is there somebody around him who knows how to put on a top tier challenge, a top tier race? And if there are people around you who can do that, then you maybe go to that top tier. If you know how to raise money and garner resources, or you have people around you who do, or a party who does, then you go to the top tier. But if you are new and you don't do those things and you can't do those things and you don't know how to do those things, that's when you sort of start to separate and you start to say, well, you know, we don't know if that's going to get to that next level or not. So let's, I mean, it, it, that's a good opening to just, just starting in mean, district one. I'll give you an example. You know, this was, this was a seat Jeff Andrew held uh, uh, in the Senate and in, the, in that before that in the assembly for, for 17 years as a Democrat, Mike Testa flipped it in 2019. That was the beginning of a decrease in the size of the South Jersey Democratic delegation in the legislature. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll be the first to say, it. 
I don't know very much about Charles Laspada, his Democratic opponent. I, you know, I, I, I did a little looking. He's a union electrician. I don't know much about him. Doesn't seem to me like one is is on the table. And, you know, we shouldn't discuss all 40 districts unless somebody disagrees. But then you get to two and two is supposed to be competitive. It is it is for, for some reason I'm mean, going back to the 1970s. This district has gone back and forth so many times. Vince Palestina, I think, was the underdog going into 2021 against Vince Mazio. He pulled it out. It was a good year for Republicans in South Jersey. Uh, uh, Joe, I feel, you know, I know you're, you've, you've worked all these numbers in these races, but but these were these were some strong Chitterelli. This was strong Chitterelli part of the state. Uh, so you have Palestine and Gardening Swift. Uh, uh, I don't know if Victor Carmona, Car- Carmona from uh, Pleasant Valley is a councilman there. I don't know if he is uh, if he is is really a, a, a competitive candidate. I don't know if he's going to wind up being the candidate uh, because Democrats didn't have their candidate there days before the convention. Uh, they blew past their filing deadline without having anybody. So they've got a guy there. I wouldn't be surprised if the climate gets better if that gets switched out. One thing about South Jersey Democrats is, is they will find the money when they, they need to find the money. Uh, but Karen Fitzpatrick's a good candidate. Uh, you know, She's one countywide. She ran in a competitive race. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hear great things about Alfonso Harrell, who is a, 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 a veteran uh, who, who, who came, you know, left the military, came back and, and he became a, a kindergarten teacher. Uh, you know, it's just an interesting story. But but are we right now? I mean, there's f- from the filing day perspective. I mean, there's 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 is there anything here that says, wow, this is this is going to be a, a really, uh, really competitive race? Or is this is this a is this a leans Republican right now? I mean, I think the Democrats have assembled a compelling slate here. And I think that that comes from several places. I think, as you were saying, Alfonso Harrell, intriguing candidate never run before, so we don't know exactly how he'll be as a candidate, but definitely intriguing background. Karen Fitzpatrick, proven vote getter. Victor Comona, don't know as much about him either, but, you know, he's an office holder. He he at least has some background in this. Um, so it's a compelling slate. The question is whether it is a slate that can overcome an equally compelling slate from the Republicans in a district that where Democrats really struggle to get the kind of turnout they need in off years where the electorate, the Democratic electorate is heavily based around Pleasantville and Atlantic City. And those are populations that just, they tend to be powerhouses in presidential years and mm-hmm. any year off of that start to decrease, decrease, decrease. Um, one other interesting thing is, um, so there was a deal in this district that were Democrats, like the Atlantic Democratic Organization and sort of South Jersey Democrats more broadly agreed to put at least one person of color on this ticket in a district that has a big minority population, but I don't think it's ever elected a minority legislator. And right now I believe they, they have two. I think Victor Carmona is, um, I'm actually not positive about this, but I believe he's Latino and Alfonso Harrell is black. Um, so that's sort of an interesting an interesting dynamic in a district that has a big chunk of its population that's never really properly been represented that way legislatively. Um, so yeah, there's lots, there's lots of potential dynamics at play here. The question is whether they get invested in what or whether they're Republicans who are very moderate, very clever politicians. You know, they, they have a lot of strengths in their own right. We're able to just kind of shut that down right from the beginning. I would say that um, it's clear that the Atlantic County Democrats are making a greater concentration of effort in Pleasantville um, with this candidate. But we also knew that with the freeholder seat, the freeholder map that they pursued with with uh, the Pleasantville-based district. And so they look like that that's going to be an area of concentration for them. And um, so it would not surprise me to see, um, um, you know, a, a good challenge in this district of any of the places we're going to look at tonight. This would be the one in South Jersey that you think could catch on. I would say Palestina has has uh, had an eye in Trenton toward um voting for democratic initiatives from time to time. Um, and so clearly he's not taking anything for granted. Joey, you call him a moderate and clearly he does govern as a moderate, but um, um, he's got an eye looking over his shoulder, I think at the uh, the moderates and the other people in the, in the other party in the county as well. So this is one that you could imagine could catch on. And Palestina 2.0 is, it's, 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 it is a, a 
different person than Vince Palestina when he was in the legislature a decade before. He has he has figured out I mean, whether you know whether you like him or not, whether you agree with his votes or not. The guy has figured out how to be a senator, and 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 that is that's that's a big part of it. And uh, uh, you know works works with Governor Murphy when he needs to. Works with the other side, and that's sort of you know it's it's. It's Gormley esque. Not that there will ever, 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 ever be another Bill Gormley, but it's Gormley esque in that in that ability to make make these deals. So so let's go right into the you know what will probably be the greatest race uh, in the state in the primary and in the general, which is which is District Three. The the you know we you know we own all likelihood should be sitting here going, yeah, Steve Sweeney uh, is going to win easily. You know he's got. You know, no problem. I don't know who this guy is that they're running against him. Never heard of him. Right. Safe seat for Sweeney. Ed Durr, is- I think he ran in previous years. I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah. I mean, this is so. This is not. Please, no money. Yeah. yeah, this is not a conversation that that even two years later we were expecting to have. But here we are talking about Senator Ed Durr, uh, Ed the Trucker, running running for reelection, uh, and. And this is this is one of these situations where, you know, I mean, I I saw I saw somebody on on social media yesterday uh, quoting Tom Crone, the new Camden County Republican chairman, who said this is why Republicans can't have nice things. <laughs> because here you've got, you know, and, and Joey, you know, jump in with these numbers. I mean, this was this was a an, an enormously strong district. For Jack Chitterelli and and you know it was like, the, it was like a sixteen or something 16 like that points. yeah it was, yeah and yeah. and this is you know you know you know whether you know the, we all try and 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 we we all love the the story of the truck driver with you know with without a lot of money coming in and, and winning but but you know Ed Durr will be the first to admit uh, he was the beneficiary of some outstanding coattails but now uh, there are. There is a split party, and there has been a split party for uh, for a while down there. Uh, first, we 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 thought it was going to be the the mayor of East East Greenwich. Am I saying it right? Am I talking, saying it South? Are, yes. East Greenwich. You know, then then it became Mickey Ostrom, the uh, uh, the the Salem County Commissioner. Uh, we had, you know Beth uh, Sawyer had said she wasn't going to run. They go through the conventions, and and you know Durr Durr gets the gets the line in Cumberland. He gets the line in Salem. He he's awarded the line in in Gloucester. Ostrom says no thanks, I'm out. And now, just in the last couple of days, Beth Sawyer has stepped forward, and and you know there's 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 some compelling arguments. Uh, on her behalf, also, uh, uh, she outpolled Ed Durr in the last election. You know, we all talk about how you beat Steve Sweeney. She beat John Bersicelli, mm-hmm. you know, a, a 20 year assemblyman, uh, you know, with a tremendous following in Gloucester County. She won Gloucester County. Uh, I don't think Durr won Gloucester. So, you know, not a, you know, you know, a, this is, this is a, a, a this is, this is really quite a race. And, and, you know, we, we have to talk about, Three in the you know sort of in the context of four also because uh, these slates have gone old school uh, where where they have run full countywide slates in Gloucester County uh, and I and I think they're running some in Camden County also for some of the other for the other district but but this is a full slate so this is this is a low turnout year that Joey was talking about. Uh, I have no idea what the primary model vote model is going to look like. Uh, 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 you you get to a point, you know, you, you you look at this, you look at this race, and and the Senate leads the ticket, and then it's the Assembly, and then there's candidates for for surrogate and for county commissioner, and a whole lot of names. A lot of people aren't going to know right countywide. So so when you know, Michael, when that happens, yeah, is how much how when, when there's a full slate uh, for both tickets, does that negate the value of the organization line? It certainly diminishes it. A lot comes down to at that point the draw, which which order 
um, you're going to be. But what it means, it means it definitely means this. It means that it, it's impossible to hide your up your 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 bracket that's up and down up you know your entire line that's up and down uh, the ballot. It's impossible to hide that completely, um, and uh, you're not going to be off buried off you know on the reverse page of the ballot. Um, so there's that. If you get a better ballot position than the county organization, you're going to have a superior ballot placement with a full line. I mean, we've seen that. We saw that a couple of times last year where we would argue that in Bergen County, um, you know, uh, uh, Pilata almost had a, a better position. Was it Pilata? I don't remember. But we would yeah. we would argue that in a couple of cases, the renegades had better ballot position because of the ballot design, because they had an up and a down um, you know, line all the way. Um, it was impossible to hide them. Yeah. And what we don't really know is how strong the Gloucester Republican organization is at defending its preferred candidates in primaries. Because until very recently, pretty much anyone the Gloucester Republicans ran anywhere, except for the second congressional district and, and, and like some, some municipal level races, were kind of sacrificial lambs. Like, you know, they could ram their heads against the wall of Sweeney and Norcross and county level candidates or whatever, and they just weren't really getting anywhere. And then suddenly in 2021, they got somewhere and they beat a Senate president and some county commissioners and the sheriff and et cetera. And now one of those county commissioners is running for, for state Senate. Um, but so we don't really know, you know, the, the, the Gloucester Republicans have proven that they can be a force to be reckoned with in general elections, but the, the ability to, to have a slate that really means something is still, I just don't know. And I think that honestly, their biggest asset, at least in district three, is that they have Ed Durr at the top of their ticket. I think that he, you know, whatever, whatever his struggles in various ways is a, like, he's a top name item really among Republican primary voters who love the story of the local truck driver who beat the Senate president. And yeah. so I think that Barring anything else, that's that's a draw for them. But I would I would add I agree with everything you said, except that I would add a comment at the end of the sentence and then say we think we think yeah, it we think. is liked among conservatives uh, and primary voters. We think his name is recognized because we all know them. But the three of us, let's face it, and, and are, social media knows him. We're that, that's all two hundred names on this ballot, so. You know, so I don't know. I haven't. I yeah. don't know how strong he is. And it's not scaring on either side right now. Yeah, it's not scaring Beth Sawyer away, right? So yeah, absolutely. Yep, I I agree. It's it's it is a complete unknown. Um, he has not driven his name recognition with hundreds of thousands of dollars of advertising, right? So we, you know, either in the last race or since then. So we just it is a complete wild card. What kind of penetration he's got and. Um, Who's going to come out and vote this time? Yeah. So, Joey, there were the, one of the decisions that Beth Sawyer made over the weekend that I think is an interesting one is she only picked one assembly candidate, uh, not because she couldn't get another assembly candidate. We we see there was there, there were high quality candidates running for surrogate and county commissioner, but she's made a strategical decision not to go after her, her old running mate, uh, Beth Ann McCarthy Patrick. Uh, is that, I mean, that, that we don't get that a lot. Typically pill, people fill out an entire ticket, but she's saying, you know, I, I like my ex running mate. We're in different sides in the Senate race, but, but I don't want to, I don't want to go after her. Is, is that, is that a good strategy, Joey? Is that, well, I mean, I think what you just said is exactly what it is. I like my old running mate. I don't want to go after her. I don't know whether it's strategic at all. I don't know whether it's a good strategy or a bad strategy or whether strategy really figures into it all that specifically. I think that this is a case of she, her quarrel was never with Beth Ann McCarthy Patrick. And this is, I mean, but, but the problem is in the way that New Jersey does its assembly elections is that there's no particular way to designate, I am no. running for this seat and not for that one. No, there's not. And so that puts Joseph Collins, who is her assembly running mate, in an odd position of he will appear just on the ballot against Beth Ann McCarthy Patrick and then the Ed Durr's third running mate, Tom Tedesco. But I guess Sawyer will direct him to only attack Tedesco, which will just, it'll be odd. I mean, I it's always, you try to do these kinds of maneuvers, they're always a little strange. 
Yeah, I don't I don't like I like it as a rhetorical point in the primary to the organizational folks, to the insiders. That's great to say you're not running against her. That's that's fine. But mathematically, I don't like that the other side gets two votes and your side gets one unless they just bullet for Collins and they don't vote their other vote. Uh, so mathematically, you're putting yourself, I think, at a little bit of a disadvantage. Um, I also think that. Um, uh, you are missing out on the opportunity to get another anchor on your ticket from another town, from another part of the district that has a little bit of a base. So I think you're passing up an opportunity. I don't, I don't really ever like that strategy. So, so the, the, the reporting that I've done on the candidates in this race, uh, and I think it's, it's been exactly two times since Saturday, uh, is Joseph Collins Jr., comma, the nephew of former Assembly Speaker Jack Collins. Uh, now, you know, to me, that's cool. To me, you know, I mean, I was, you know, I, you know, you know, one, one, of, one of my jobs in 1985 was recruiting candidates. And I got I got sent way, way down the New Jersey Turnpike to to Elmer to meet with this school board candidate uh, who, who they thought might be a good recruit for the assembly. And it was it was Jack Collins. But but. Jack Collins is out of office for 22 years, and and that's a you know that's a I don't, you know that, that's a fairly you know you don't look at Joe Collins and say wow that must be Jack Collins's family it's it's not you know it's it's not you know it's it's not Kennedy or Kane or or you know or 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 something like that is does having Micah you I mean this is this is your part of the state yeah. is having Jack Collins is unless you unless you spend money reaching out to older Republican primary voters to say, Hey, this guy, he's, you remember Jack Collins, that's his nephew. Does right. it, does it matter? I don't think it matters um, general election wise, general perception wise. Again, since we talk about primaries as low turnout affairs, as motivated insiders who are coming out to vote, you know, 10 percent of the population, um, you know, those are people who are going to remember Jack. And so that could make a difference to them. The other thing that I think electorally not so much is the knowledge that Jack has. And to the extent that his nephew, you know, wants to hear how it's done and wants to hear how these races are, are fought and wants to, um, you know, get a real insider's perspective, I think that that can be valuable. That can be worthwhile. I don't know how engaged Jack will be in, in, in the race, but, um, you know, I think that that's, you know, when we talk about knowing how to run a competitive race, that's what I'm looking for. That's the kind of knowledge I'm looking for, uh, how to raise money, that kind of thing. You know, Jack knows all the pieces better than anybody in that part of the state. And I'll tell you, nobody in New Jersey and, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, as far back as I can go, nobody in New Jersey can stand on the assembly floor and and relay the story of giving uh, mouth to mouth resuscitation <laughs> to a pig on his farm quite the way Jack Collins can. Sure. He, he was a special guy, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it you know translates. As you no, say. it doesn't. I want to talk about the generals after we talk about three and four primaries, if that's OK. But but, you know, I, we, we shouldn't ignore the fact that that John Bersicelli, the Democratic candidate, uh, he's the one that the party settled on uh, after Steve Sweeney decided he didn't want to do this. Uh, uh, he's got a primary, too. Uh, he's he's got uh, uh, Mario DeSantis, uh, who's making his third run in three years, although once it, the first campaign, I think, lasted just a couple hours. Uh, I mean, a familiar name, at least at least us, Tansy Youngblood, is 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 coming back. And, and she had she had run, you know, a, a, a decent race against Jeff Andrew in a Democratic okay. primary. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, but I mean, Joey, any chance? that the Camden County Democratic machine, the, the, the South Jersey Democratic machine, uh, can't pull off a primary in District 3? It's hard to imagine this primary going all that many places. I mean, we can start looking at fundraising reports and, and reports from the district and see it, see if it see, seems like there's any sort of breaths of life here. But this is just a tough district for someone who is not, who for Democrats who are not affiliated with the party in general. Because not only is it you know, part of the core of the South Jersey Democratic machine. But it's also beyond that, a competitive district where Democrats aren't necessarily in the mindset of like electing the local like progressives or whatever, and more in the mindset of we need to win the seat back from Ed Durr. So 
I think that this is, I mean, this is one of only two races in the state where you actually have a really specific sort of like progressive versus establishment divide. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't see from where I stand right now, where I sit, how it goes anywhere. And let me, let me, let's, I want to just do a, a quick tangent, which, you know, people that know me know that, that there's a lot of tangents and they're never quick, but I'll, I'll try and, and keep it that way. Uh, Joey, don't laugh too much. I, you know, but, but so there's three of us. We'll, we'll t- we, maybe we just vote on it. Not, none of us have county chairman telling us how to do this. So we're all independent voters here. Did Steve Sweeney make the right or wrong decision to not run again for the state Senate? Joey, mm-hmm. I want to start with you. Well, I'm actually speaking on behalf of Amalia Duarte, the chairwoman of the Morris County Democratic Party. So um, <laughs> what she think? No. Um, I mean, I don't know. I think that there is a decent chance that that would have led to another loss and that would end the Steve Sweeney as we know it. But it also there's a decent chance it would have led to him holding office again and being a major power broker instead of being the guy who is most famous for having lost and running a governor's race that's going to be really difficult for him to win. So that's a pretty equivocal answer, but I'm going to leave it at that. I think it only would have given him the the redemption of having come back from the loss and won, right? So it would not have put him in that position where he's the guy who lost to Ed Durr. He's the guy who came back and beat Ed Durr. And that's a compelling story. That's a that's an improvement to the narrative, right? But I don't think um, the next two years in the Senate would necessarily give him... Uh, I don't think it's going to, it wouldn't bolster his Democratic credentials. I mean, let's face it, uh, he would be at odds again with the governor. I mean, he's not going to be the governor's foot soldier. He's never going to be. And so does that endear him to a Democratic primary statewide? I don't, I don't think it does. So I don't, I think it was probably the right call not to run. Yeah. And I agree. I think it was absolutely the right call. I mean, you know, Sweeney could go back to the Senate. There was clearly, it was a path to him going back to the Senate, but there's no path to him going back to being the president of the Senate. Right. And, and he had that, he was the longest serving legislative leader in the history of the state. What was he going to do? Sit in the back row and watch other people and, and people who have been waiting a long time to move up. Uh, they're not going to let Steve Sweeney leapfrog back in. So, so I, I think he made the right call. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's talk about district four. And then I want to talk about the general elections and in, in both of them. So, so here all of a sudden we've got a primary two. And, and the primary is, you know, it's, it's, it's not as much about personality. It seems like Ed, the Durr-Sawyer primary is personality driven. I haven't, I haven't heard yet. I'm sure we will, but I haven't heard yet differences on, on, on legislation. My guess is the two of them tend to vote the same, but, but that's personality. So all of a sudden District 4 uh, which is which is a, a a absolute Republican pickup. I think uh, absolute republic opportunity for Republican pickup. And and I mean this. I don't think there's a district in the state where they should have been better positioned to flip a district than the fourth. It, it, you know, Joey. I hope you'll you'll go through the numbers here. But. Uh, they, they have Nick DeSilvio, who's one county wide. He's a uh, he's a Navy veteran. He's been on a school board in Franklin, which is a, a, a pretty good town for Republicans in Gloucester County. Uh, became involved as a as a special needs parent, uh, advocating for his his child. On paper, he's a really good candidate. But but you know, I, I guess my first. Let me go in two directions. The first question for Joey is, is tell me about this district and why Republicans should have been optimistic. And then I want to I want to talk about maybe why there's this primary here. I mean, the reason why they're optimistic is is pretty simple. It's just it's a South Jersey district where, like most other sort of South Jersey districts that aren't directly based around Camden, um, where Jack Chitterelli did quite well. So he won it by five points. And that's that on the old district lines, Murphy won, it, won the same district by two points. So that's, you know, right off the bat, seven point swing to the to the right in a district that until this year, neither party saw as particularly interesting. Um, and you've also got three open seats. You've got Senator Fred Madden retiring. You've got Assemblyman Paul Moriarty running to replace him. And you've got Assemblyman Gabriela Mascara retiring. So, I mean, just on paper, that's that's pretty obviously competitive. But at the same time, 
um, and I think the 2022 elections really showed this, this is a district where Democrats, the, the Democratic operation still has a pretty tight grip on things. Um, you know, Chitterelli broke through in a way that nobody was really expecting him to, and that swept a lot of other people in as well, including uh, Nick DeSilvio, who I'm no no shade to him, but it's definitely, you know, his win was heavily predicated on Chitterelli doing really well. And then in 2022, when he didn't have that effect, Democrats collectively, so this is Donald Norcross and Jeff Van Drew, won this district by a pretty solid margin. So <clears throat> I think that you're seeing kind of a competition here between longer term trends in a district that's maybe more on the on the sort of small C conservative side um, versus the continued strength of the South Jersey operation that when it really wants to get off, it can oftentimes just do that. And it'll have a lot of money to do it and it'll have a lot of tourists behind it. I think it's I think it's one of those um, situations where an opportunity creates a lot of you know a lot of a lot of people sniff an opportunity and, and nobody's willing to stand down. You've got a, one of the problems for um, for this district for the Republicans that there there are a lot of different county organizations that have a piece of it and nobody's really willing to stand down for each other um and there's no clear consensus and so you've got these rival slates that have formed uh there's a there's a guy trenton news network talks about this uh this this match that's going between elec 825 and ibw 351 and they sort of aligned with both of these both of these slates they are sort of aligned with both of the freeholder, the county commissioner slates um, in the various counties. And, uh, and and like I said, I think it's one of those things where um, you see an opportunity and there are a lot of there's not just one side that's interested. And in I think there's more than one side that wants wants a piece of this. So I'm Chris, we should maybe, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, we should just maybe like for people who don't already have these names swimming around in their heads because we haven't explicitly spelled it out. So basically what's happening in this district is you have one slate led by County Commissioner Nick DeSilvio that has the lines in Camden and Gloucester counties, uh, which are most of the district. And then another slate led by uh, Christopher Del Borello, who's a former Washington Township Councilman. He has the slate in Atlantic County, but he also has support from a lot of other Republican officials ar around the state who are not part of the district. Um, and so that's the that's the main competition that we're talking about here is the sort of the battle between those two slates. And the Silvio slate is associated with Durr and the Del Borello slate is associated with Sawyer. So that's where that ties in. There is yet another assembly candidate who I had never heard of before, but I met today, John Keating, who just sort of adds a, a, a third unknown quantity to the mix. Um, so this is th this is the most I, I think the most unpredictable and. Um, probably the most competitive primary in the state. We'll see. I think it, it maybe shares that with three and 24. Well, yeah. well it's, it's important to note in this primary, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the two candidates running, uh, running with Nick DeSilvio, Michael Clark, 24 years old. He's, I'm told, impressed a lot of people uh, in Gloucester County. Uh, uh, and Denise Gonzalez, who ran last year, uh, uh, a union member and uh, and a veteran, but uh, but she didn't do she didn't do great last year. Then the important name I think on this list of candidates is Matt Walker, uh, former uh, former uh, Buna uh, Council President, uh, but more importantly, a member of the executive board of the International. Uh, union of Operating Engineers Local 825, uh, a union that is is not, uh, you know, th they don't like to lose. If they're going to get in, they're going to play to win or they're not going to get involved at all. Uh, he is he is, you know, on their executive board, uh, which which makes me think that they're playing to win. And the other thing, and you will hear this both as a pro and as a con in this district is is the presence of uh, of. Uh, uh, Don Purdy, the new Atlanta County, the reasonably new Atlanta County Republican chairman, uh, he has been looking to get a, a foothold, you know, expand Atlanta County's mm -hmm. footprint on the leg in, in in the legislature. Uh, he's been promoting Matt Walker for about a year now. If you if you listen to one side, you'll say well, Purdy has come in and he's trying to take over Gloucester County, right? Uh, 
you know, and, and, and again, I don't know, Mike, have you ever seen anything like that where some guy in South Jersey comes in from <laughs> another part of the South and tries to take over another part of the South? The, re the reason they're saying that is the geography is, is Buna is, is a very small part mm -hmm. of the district. It's a little, you know, little, little tiny part of the district. It's a little tiny part of Atlantic. It's sort of, you know, the, 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 the buffer between the two counties. And, um, but if it comes uh, to the money, that the size of its hometown doesn't matter as much. No, it doesn't. It's also new to the district, right? So that's the other factor. Gloucester's been part of the fourth forever, um, but 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 uh, the Bunas have not. The Bunas have been in the first district and in the second district. They've been sort of all over the map over the years. Yeah. So let me say something about about Chris Del Barello, former Washington Township Councilman, Washington. Uh, is the largest town in Gloucester County. He he served one term. Uh, he's been out of office, I guess, about nine years. Uh, and he now lives in Gloucester Township, the largest town in the district, in Camden County. So so one of the interesting things that's I think at play here is if he were able to pull off the primary and he were able to pull off the general. Then you have a Republican with senatorial courtesy over Camden County. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we all know that's that's a big deal. Uh, uh, and I think that might that might push his it's also, I, I think, uh, you know, worth pointing out that Christel Borello's brother won a seat on the Washington Township Council last year. So. You know, he comes from a, a, a local family. Uh, I don't know. I haven't seen any polling numbers. I don't think the candidates have seen any polling numbers. And and I think this is I think this is the, you know, you know, as three and four. I mean, you know, you know, we're I, I don't want people. Please don't turn us off this quickly. But but New Jersey is going to get a lot less dramatic in the primary as we move out of out of that Gloucester, you know, Glo Gloucester County County region. I mean. I don't know. I don't know about the two of you. I I don't I don't know to call this race here. Yeah, and remember, um, the the uh, the Democrats held on in Gloucester County, the control of Gloucester County, but they lost the election, as you're saying, in Washington Township, the biggest mm -hmm. town in the in the district. So um, it's um, you know this is this is a real it's a real coin toss at this point. Yeah, what's going to happen? So so let, let let's let's shift back to three and four. On what we're looking at in the general, and 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 you know, uh, I'll start by saying that that I think a very strong concern for Republicans in a part of the state where they're looking to keep a seat that they flipped uh, that they should on paper be able to keep uh, in the third district and flip a district that they should be able to flip in the fourth. Uh, I'm wondering whether these candidates can get out of this primary uh, without hating each other so right. much that the winner of the primary is is unelectable. Uh, and, and we are you know, we're going to deal with that. We're going to deal with it in social media. Uh, we're going to see people taking sides and saying terrible things about one candidate or the other. You know, Micah, you, you, you've seen these kind of primaries before. Sure. You know, do do they need do the candidates on both sides need to should they should they just put it all out there, leave nothing on the field and try and win the primary or or should I, they be restrained? In order I think some them? discipline, I think some discipline helps. And, you know, the last time um, the last time one of the operating engineers candidates was on the ballot, Kate Gibbs, it got pretty nasty, right? Different district, but it got very nasty, very personal. And nobody should want that. Like you say, if you're going to come back after the primary and come back together and win the general election, you don't want to tear each other to ribbons. I mean, Joey, based, based on you're watching this, do you, do you see Ed Durr and Beth Sawyer right now? Things can change a lot of time between now and the primary, but right now, do you see those two getting together for a victory break yeah. after the election? Probably not. I mean, I think that the, the, especially in these races where people are not necessarily paying very close attention yet. And a lot of people will never pay very close attention, even come November. I think that the effect of these sort of nasty primaries can maybe be a little bit overstated. Like, you know, if, 
if candidates go to various candidate brunches and slam the other candidates as, I don't know, incompetence or whatever, that's not great for the overall image of the Republican Party, but it also, that might not penetrate all that far. I think the thing that this benefit, I think what these really sort of intense primaries, who they benefit the most are the Democrats running against them who are able to essentially get the next three months completely scot-free. Like the general election has started for them, especially for Paul Moriarty, less so for Berzicelli, who do, who does technically have a primary, who's, who, you know, his party doesn't control the seat right now. Um, but the ability to sort of get out in front and just run your campaign in a general election footing for eight months while your opponents are stuck in mud for an, another three, that's definitely that's definitely something that South Jersey Democrats are going to be pretty happy about. The, the parties usually, usually find a way to come back together or paper it over or a reasonable amount of papering over, right? But not always. I mean, you know, the first big race that I won in my former life uh, that I managed um, was uh, Van Drew in 1994 managed to win countywide in Cape May County for like a third time since the Civil War as a Democrat because Frank Lobiondo and Bill Gormley had torn each other apart in the primary that year, 94, excuse me. And um and it didn't come back together for them in time for the general and nobody was helping each other. So if, you know, if the Linwood Republicans were disaffected because the wrong candidate won the won the primary, they were just sitting on their hands that year. And I guess that's the real risk that you run. If, if Washington and ha Washington Township Republicans are unhappy because their brother can brother's candidate loses the primary, are they going to come out or in a low turnout affair? Are they just going to sit on their hands and and not crank out the vote in their town? That's the risk that you run. And look, Bersicelli, you know, we, 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 we should be, you know, you know, as long as we're giving a fair analysis of this, you know, John Bersicelli is a good candidate, but he's by no means a perfect candidate. Uh, he's got 20 years of votes that that Ed Durr and or Beth Sawyer are going to be able to talk about, uh, you know, every everything that Jim McGreevy and and Dick Cody and John Corzine and Phil Murphy, you know, did over that period of time, they're going to be able to tie John Bersicelli to it in a part of the state that that has clearly shifted uh, mm -hmm. even Democrats to be uh, be more conservative. Uh, so Bersicelli's Bersicelli is going to have to deal with that also, uh, yeah, and how yeah. they define him. And it's it's going to be the same thing with with Paul Moriarty. I mean, I'm you know he's 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 a strong candidate. He's you know, he uh, 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 he became the choice of South Jersey Democrats uh, because they did do a poll and 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 Moriarty had his own identity. But, you know, I am uh, I'm going to I'm going to you know date myself here because I'm going to make a, you know, a, a reference to, you know, you know, more than a decade before before Joey joined us. And, and that is that's Anthony Marcella, uh, you know, solid, solid vote getter in the assembly, but ran for the Senate in 91, bad mm -hmm. climate for him. And he got wiped out. Oh, what, when you mean joined us, you mean like joined you in the world of existence. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what I mean. I mean, so, so you know, it's, it's Bersicelli going to have to deal with that too. Uh, uh, you know, Dave, people say good things about Dave Bailey is a candidate from, from Salem doesn't have a record to attack. And, and Heather Simmons, uh, you know, is is part of sort of this 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 new. It's, it's almost the new math now. It used to be that you you serve in public office for a lot of years, and then you go you're given a job at Rowan. Uh, you know, maybe maybe to 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 raise your uh, uh, your pension. But now what's happening is it's Rowan's growing candidates. They're coming from Rowan and going to the legislature. You know, I look at District Four. Uh, people in South Jersey tell me Cody Miller is a star. He's in his early thirties. He, he runs the, uh, the Rowan, uh, university foundation, uh, you know, worked in the legislature. He, he worked for Paul Moriarty. People say he is just, just really, really good. And then Dan Hutchison councilman in Gloucester township. I mean, he started out, he was a Republican congressional candidate running against Rob Andrews. And he's got, he's got his own base in a, in a democratic town. So, uh, I think it's just going to be interesting races, and I think I think if we look at these races, if we if we get to to Labor Day, and and the Republicans are still eating their young, 
Right. I mean, then then I don't I don't know that they can win. Well, think about what you just said. You said, you know, Cody Miller's a professional fundraiser, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and that's one of the that's one of the criteria I'm looking for is do you know how to raise money? Do you know yeah. how to get resources behind your campaign? Of course, this is in the South Jersey Democrats backyard. Yeah. Of course, there's going to be resources. But the fact that he knows how to do that professionally and, and uh, you know, from day one, this is going to be a well-funded. You know, I don't agree with you at all. No, I don't agree with you at all because Cody, poor Cody Miller could spend all day long, you know, on <laughs> he's not going to want to dialing for dollars. And, and what's he going to do? Walk into George Norcross's office and say, look at this. I raised $61,000. Do you think that's going to impress? The <laughs> and the you know, it's almost, it's almost like that's one of the blessings you get when you're part of the South Jersey machine is they take the fundraising responsibilities off the table. They just want you to go out and get votes. And, and Cody Miller, I mean, Young, he's I think he's been in office since his early 20s uh, as a school board member, as a councilman. Uh, you know, I I don't know if it's the fundraising that puts him over. I think. Well, it's it's a, either either way. And, and you know that 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 they want you to see that you're real. They want you to see that you're raising your money. But it's it's a lot of the same skill set of introducing yourself to voters. Yeah. One other thing that I'll add about the slate, then we should probably we should probably move yeah. on from this this two district sinkhole here. But so by the way, um, we're going to move very quickly, you know, through the state. So yeah, there, there's some districts we'll be able to, to talk about a lot faster. But in the in this district, two of the three incumbents, Fred Madden and Gabriela Mosquera, um, abstained or voted no on the Freedom of Reproductive Choice Act, which is one of the bills that, in my mind, is like the ultimate flashpoint for point, for yeah. where you are as a Democrat or a Republican. Mm -hmm. Because if you're Stain too on the sort of moderation yeah. the spectrum. And those two are Fred Madden and Gabrielle Mascara. They're both retiring. Paul Moriarty, the one yes vote from this district, is the one who is now leading the ticket. Right. Um, so, and I don't know what Dan Hutchinson, Hutchinson and Cody Miller's politics, like ideologies are, but you're definitely seeing here and you're seeing in a couple of other districts too, um, where some of the more centrist voices in both parties are um, are heading for the exits and the people who replace them aren't necessarily extreme or anything like that, but they're definitely, you might be losing some of those true mavericky votes. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to spend, the, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about, about districts that have no primaries and, and aren't likely competitive in the, in the general, you know, and, and yeah. I apologize. we should congratulate Republicans for finding nine candidates to run in five, six, and seven, and then probably yeah. move on because that's yeah. kind of all that's happening there. You know, and I, and I you know, it, it is noteworthy that that uh, Jim Fizone, the Senate candidate in seven, uh, uh, who I mean, he's, he's I don't he's not going to beat Troy Singleton, but but he was mayor of Burlington City and he was a Democrat and he was he was one of those Democrats who uh, uh, supported a Republican governor for re-election in 2013, a Republican governor who attracted, was in, is in New Hampshire this evening, uh, testing the waters for another presidential run. And I can tell you, I made a call before I did this to uh, uh, somebody up there. Uh, he he drew just an enormous crowd tonight. He had, he had about 80 people <laughs> come out to do his town hall meeting. So, you know, so I don't, I don't know that, I don't know if that he's going to really be a, a much help to, to Fizone. It's, it's, uh, I don't know. I'm not going to go in that direction, but, <laughs> but, but I do want to talk quickly about eight, no primaries in eight. Uh, but, but uh, Democrats continue to be optimistic. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen this before. I've seen it, you know, in, 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 in 17 and eight in, in 19 and 21, uh, uh, you know, this is a district still, I think it became a little more Republican in redistricting and, mm -hmm. and Democrats haven't won here since 1973 in the Watergate year. So, so this is tough. I mean, just let, let, let's go through it quickly, but, but Joey, I mean, Lay, you did an analysis with, with Latham Tiver. I mean, he's, uh, you know, this is the Gene Stanfield, open seat, Latham Tiver, former freeholder, uh, uh, top level guy at the International Union of Operating Engineers, mm -hmm. Local 25. Uh, again. There we go, you know, and, it, and Heather Cooper, uh, councilwoman in Evesham, uh, vice chair of the Burlington County uh, Democratic Committee. I mean, you know, I was, 
I was waiting for Jaws. I really was. I was waiting for the recruitment of Ron Jaworski yeah. to sort of make this this race. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, is, is, is there anything really to say about it now, other than than still leaning Republican? We'll see. We'll see how the district unfolds. I mean, this it's is the me. district. Has, it's been the ultimate like. Lucy moving the football for Democrats for the past few years, mm -hmm. where every year it's this year is going to be the year. Um, and 2021 was the strongest case yet, where they literally had an incumbent because Don Diego had switched parties. And so they didn't even have to win it to have an incumbent there. And she still lost. Now the district's gotten a bit more Republican. I think this year is the first in, it, this is the first of the last three cycles where Democrats aren't being like, this is when we're going to win it. This is when we're going to win it. Mm -hmm. I think in this ticker, ticket, it's got Heather Cooper, who's won several tough races in the biggest town in the district. It's got Andrea Katz, who is also a pretty prominent figure in Burlington Democratic circles. It's got Anthony Angelosi, who's from Hamilton, which that anchors that part of the district. Right. This President is the kind of team yeah. yep. that could absolutely win and then be good legislators from there. But I don't think it's the type of ticket that is so obviously strong that it'll convince Democrats all over again that, oh, we can win it this year. So I don't, I don't necessarily see this being one of those districts where people are just talking about it all the time. But I keep on like adding caveats to my caveats. It's the kind, it, this is the kind of slate where it's not like this is Democrats completely fumbling, which I think you'll see in a couple of other districts that are competitive, that are competitive in North Jersey. Democrats just kind of, these are, these are, these are quality, these are quality candidates and it's a quality choice for voters. I think to attract um, outside support, uh, the Democrats are going to have to show um, some performance. They're going to have to show some fundraising. They're going to have to show some good polls, right? It could catch on, but, you know, let's face it, that's what we've been saying since, about this district since 1973. So, um, you know, but it's one where if they do catch on and they can show some performance, then they could attract some support. Here's one of the things that I'm looking at in District 8, and that is Latham Tiver was supposed to run for the Assembly last year. Mm -hmm. And Steve Sweeney went to the building trades, uh, you know, and, and I'm, you know, I'm conjuring up this image of a of a 1972 film that I, I shouldn't mention. But but Steve Sweeney went to the building trades and said, look, I'm I'm, I'm trying to bolster my majority. I'm your guy. I'm the iron workers. I'm, I'm, you know, getting ready to run for governor. I've got to keep my majority in the Senate. And and I don't want you know, I don't want. Uh, 825 coming in and, and muddying the waters and Latham Tiver stood down and now he's going to the Senate, which, you know, let I me mean, look, you know, apologies to the, the, the 80 members of the New Jersey general assembly, but Senate is better and Senate is better. Like Craig for, yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Senate is, you know, I mean, that's, there's, there's, there's infinitely more power and the, the ability of 825 to have a Senator, is huge to them. So what I'm going to be looking at, and when I say I'm looking at, this meeting could have already happened, and they just didn't tell me. Uh, you know, you know, I have uh, you know friends on both sides down there, uh, and and I talk to them constantly, but they don't tell me everything. Uh, and and what I'm waiting to see is 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 Greg Greg Lolovy, uh, the head of A25. Uh, is he going to go down to the building trades? Is he going to sit down? And, are they going to have a meeting and say, look, my guy stood down last time? Uh, and you guys still lost. You couldn't flip the district. Now, my guy, a, a, not just a union member, but a top official in the union is set to go to the state Senate uh, where he is a, a loyal. Uh, he will be he will be a building trades vote in the Senate. Is there a point where all these people say to Steve Sweeney, you know, all right, enough. Like we gave you your shot. You didn't get it. And and, you know, go do what you do in two and three and four. But eight, that's that's a building trade seat. and We're going to leave it alone. So I'm going to watch. Is, that. Yeah, this is this is definitely a 25 cycle. They are on the move. This cycle, they're on the move in, in, in the fourth district. They're on the move here. And uh, and they really feel like they can they can make some progress and, and use some political muscle here. And, and, it, and it is the, the, the contraction of the South Jersey Democratic machine that's at work. It's also the fact that 825 plays both sides of the fence that they are at work here, that they are that they're able to, you know, effectively, um, effectively, effectively do what they're doing. But, um, you know, it wouldn't be happening if it wasn't for the contraction of the South Jersey Democrats. So we 
we'll, we'll look at you know the next area of the state. We'll look at Ocean County and its and its affiliates. You know, districts nine, ten, uh, twelve, and thirty. Uh, uh, All four of them, the races that weren't, and each of them in different ways. I, yeah, I mean, this was supposed to be this was supposed to be the war. This was supposed to be the right. second half of George Gilmer's comeback, and and we were supposed to see primary fights there. And and now you know you know everything's gotten together. Diane Gold lost her seat, went away. You know, yep. We're picking, you know, and 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 last and Chris woman in County delegation. Yeah, Chris Chris Connors is is retiring. Uh, Gilmore's picking up a, a very close ally in the Senate. Uh, with Carmen Amato, yeah. uh, he's picking up a close ally in the assembly with Greg Meyer, but but uh, Greg McGuckin survived mm -hmm. and is now unopposed in a primary. Uh, a guy who you know just just a swing of a few a few votes. I mean, you know, really basically one small town's votes flipped to decertify the Tom's River Club. And I apologize for people listening who don't know what I'm talking about. You know, it's, 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 it's a little sad that we all know about the decertification and the recertification of the Tom's River Republican Club. But read Joey's stories on it. It'll, it'll explain it to you because it'll, it'll just make our head explode to, to just sort of go through this again. <laughs> but but Holzapple, you know, not, McGuckin was, 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 I mean, some thought he might be a goner. Mm -hmm. and, and now he's headed to re-election. Paul, and not only that, but he got someone who is more aligned with him to be his running yeah. mate, mm -hmm. successful mm -hmm. running mate, rather than someone aligned with Gilmore. He did. Uh, he did. So Paul Gil Penitra was the Point Pleasant right. Beach mayor, right? And 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 a you know a rising star and uh, played it perfectly. And you know I will say this to everybody because you got to give credit when it's due. Paul Kenitra told me four days before his convention that he was up by 15 votes. And I'm thinking to myself, well, oh God, here's another guy who can't count. There's no way he's up 15. And he, he won, won by 15, 15 votes. Uh, yeah. So so Paul, I, I will not doubt Paul Kenitra's counting ability anymore. Okay. But but this primary, this isn't there. I mean, this is, you know, this is, uh, uh, this is, this is now safe. This puts McGuckin on a path to succeed Hull's Apple. Uh, when he leaves the Senate, uh, nothing is also county. But this is it where is this is county. where Gilmore, who you know, doesn't get all the credit for the way that he's come back and you know all that. But he he does he picked his battles carefully in in you know in the, in with these legislators. He knew where the weak points were. He knew who could be convinced to to go. And uh, you know, I mean. Not, not a not a surprise because um, you know Connors does a lot of legal work and he likes doing that legal work and all that stuff. But he knew where he could push Gold aside, and he and he and he was he turned out to be right. Yeah, and Connors Connors was ready to go. Yeah, Connors yeah. was just ready to go, and and you know I don't think Gilmore was was a part of that, but but Carmen Amato, in his own right, mayor of a big town, has been working this group for a long time, and and you know he he got this easily. So George Gilmore. And this is, you know, you know, Ocean County still a little polarized after the after after the last couple of years. And then the reality yeah. is, you know, you, you've got to you've got to give credit where credit is due. George Gilmore is going to come out of this cycle up a senator and up an assembly member and yeah. up a county, you know, a, a county commissioner that's going to be, you know, maybe more assertive and and certainly close to Gilmore. He's coming out of it OK. But I'll tell you who else is coming out of this okay. And and again, I'm I'm gonna get ahead of my skis here a little bit. This is one of these tangents, but but not a bad night. The Ocean County landscape turned out to be good for Jack Chitterelli. Mm -hmm. Because what what Chitterelli sees is that uh, uh, he can if he continues to work the grassroots level, regardless of what happens at the screening committee, uh, that convention is up for grabs. And Gilmore, Gilmore is, is with Bill Spadia. Uh, and, and the Ocean County line is, 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 uh, you know, as, as Joe Biden would say, a big effing deal. Uh, so, uh, so, so, you know, Gilmore, Gilmore did well and, and Chitterelli did well, Holes Apple did well, but, mm -hmm. but there's still a lot to see there. So let's, you know, it shows that no one has clear ownership of the party. You know, no. 
That's right. I, I think multiple different factions tried to show that they were in control and and none of them succeeded necessarily in that. Nobody got everything. It's the biggest yeah. prize, like you say, it's the biggest prize in a gubernatorial primary, 10,000 votes, but it's not it's not under one person's lock and key at this point. Yeah. And you see, you know, you see you have Owen Henry headed to uh, you know, uh, headed to the Senate. Uh, it's not Sam Thompson running as a Democrat. It's it's a it's a guy named Brandon Rose. This is now, you know, still a safe seat for Republicans. Gilmore mm -hmm encouraged Henry to run. He's got a built a good relationship there. Bob Singer, uh, you know, is safe, safe, safe. Uh, always been close to Gilmore. And, you know, and the 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 Avi Schnall sensation of 2023, where, you know, where where you know many of us, you know, especially me, thought, wow, you know, we might be seeing a real play in one of the most Republican districts in the state, just based upon, you know, you know, uh, circumstances that, that Joey eloquently wrote were similar to a, a Brooklyn state senator in a very red district. Uh, that's not happening either. That that didn't materialize. So out of Ocean County going into the in, into the general, you know, we got nothing in the primary. We got nothing in the general. Right. You know, we know it's going to be legislative, basically. I mean, yeah. that's kind of what it is. You know, with yeah. with today's filing deadline passed. We now know who is headed to the legislature. And I mean, you know, the counterpoint to the Republicans recruiting all their candidates in the other districts, Democrats do have candidates in all these districts and, and good for them. And I'm glad that voters will get a choice in all this. One of the candidates in the Lakewood district in the 30th district is a former mayor of Lakewood, Marta Harrison. So that's sort of an interesting, you know, she's right. been out of office for, for a while, but that's still an interesting uh, recruitment. Yeah. But, a good, but a good person and a good vote getter. And, and yeah. you know, and I gotta, you, you got to give props to, I mean, Wyatt Earp put together a good ticket there. And yeah. and I give props to some of the municipal chairs in that district who stepped up and said, you know what, I'm just I'll I'll run myself. I'll put myself on the ballot and I'll, you know, set an example for other Democrats that, that we need to take it. You know, we go to we go to 11, uh, you know, no primaries. Nobody nobody's challenging, you know, anybody you've got. We'll we'll talk a lot about this district. This is a potentially, you know, I shouldn't say potentially potentially is is, is me tempering uh, my statement when I shouldn't have. This is a competitive district. This is a swing district. Uh, uh, Gopal is 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 a strong incumbent. He works hard. He he's raises a lot of money. He knows what he's doing. But but it's it's a swing district. And you've got two, you know, it's the only district. In the, well, except for Sam Thompson, which doesn't really count. This is the only split district in the state with a senator. So the Thompson. only district that voted for a split ticket in 2021. How's that? Yeah. For a, a yeah. You know, and, and you've got, you know, you've got, you know, two, two incumbents that have been out there working in, in Kim Ulner and Malin Perperno. Uh, Democrats, this is not one of the districts where, where, where Democrats failed in candidate recruitment. Uh, I mean, you know, Luann Peterpol is is a terrific candidate, former judge, uh, former chair of Garden State Equality, Margie Donlin. Uh, you know, we, we will actually, we're actually going to see some poll numbers on her in her hometown uh, in May because she's running for re-election in a nonpartisan race. Uh, uh, a physician uh, and, and, and looks like a, a, a good candidate. I, I don't know where you know, we're going to see how Steve Denistrian does. He is he is new. Uh, and, and, and what I'm about to say is not at all meant as as any type of a slap at Steve Denistrian. He could turn out to be a great candidate. And all of us have seen people mm -hmm. come out of nowhere mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and 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 you sit there and you say, wow, they turned out to be really good. This was a great pick. But I can't take away from the fact that Republicans didn't get their top recruits there, which would have been Tom Arnone or or right. Christine Hanlon. They didn't get those, uh, and we we'd be having you know in in March a I can't believe I'm saying March because I'm so used to filing deadlines in April, but in March you know uh, uh, we'd be having a different discussion. If and those are the candidates who could have the names you just mentioned could have gotten the party off of it on its feet and and could have really gotten things rolling and it's not to say that he won't it's just to say that's you know that's why we were looking for one of those top tiers you could see a situation where the real dogfight here is on the assembly side not on the senate side mm -hmm. yeah it could be it could be then you get to mercer county uh another 
tremendous disappointment to Joey and I and, and Micah because well, I had a fun couple of days covering the weirdness that went down there. But. <laughs> you did, you did, but but we don't, you know, we the 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 the, the county executive primary that was going to be such a, a great race that 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 fizzled. I mean, Dan right. Dan Benson is effectively, and I apologize to his Republican opponent. He he is the Mercer County executive elect. Yeah, I wouldn't say that a race that ended with an incumbent getting twenty three percent of the vote. It's not a fizzle. I was gonna, I was gonna say that too. Dan Benson executed that win very, very well uh, right. from start to finish. Yeah, yeah, and I'll tell you, I don't, I don't typically give hints for the year in review, especially in March. But, but right now, for everybody running a campaign, Benson for county executive, best campaign of the year yeah. so far. That's the. That's the bar that has been set. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, I agree. Masterfully done. But here we are going into a primary. It's going to be low turnout. We're not going to have, there's no legislative primaries. 14, and we'll talk about this more in the fall. 14 was one of the ones where Republicans needed to, to win. Uh, and they didn't, they didn't get, you know, they didn't get their, 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 their top tier. But then again, uh, we don't know how how these candidates are gonna we are gonna turn out. Uh, you know, uh, you know, no primaries in sixteen or you know or. or, Wait, or can, I, can I make a point about fourteen quickly? Yes. So I don't know whether this will interest anybody except for me. But um, I so I was following the the LD fourteen primary pretty um, intently, and the biggest surprise of it was that Wayne D'Angelo was briefly put into big trouble when he came in mm -hmm. third at the Mercer County Convention. Um, two candidates were running for Dan Benson's open seat in LD14, and it was expected that they would be competing between themselves, and instead they actually both won the convention, and D'Angelo ended up in third. Um, and then things were kind of fixed for him to, to a certain extent. You know, he he recovered in Middlesex County. He came in first there. Um, the second place finisher was Tennille McCoy. She had the line in both counties. The other candidate, Rick Carabelli, only had it in Mercer, so he dropped out. So the primary's over. But one interesting legacy of it, and if you have been avidly for some reason looking at my posts every day about who has filed for the legislature you might have noticed this is that from what i can tell wayne d'angelo still does not technically have the mercer democratic line even though he doesn't have any opponents for it hmm. because every other mercer county candidate has the slogan regular democratic organization and wayne d'angelo has the slogan mercer county regular democratic organization which no voter in their sane mind would ever notice that as a difference. But I think, I believe that it's a sign that he still technically does not have the line, which is just an interesting relic of a very strange couple of days in the race. Yeah. But Janice Miranoff will fix that. So, you know, they've got it. They've still it got doesn't it. matter. This is unopposed. Yeah. So who cares? I, but and by the way, by the way, I can see this as a footnote in, 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 in Flavio Cumves's brief in his, lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of the organization line that that the guy Rick Carabelli who who got more votes when you combine the two counties in total had to drop out because he didn't win Middlesex County right so, so that is that you know that that's that's one of you know one of a lot of little talking points that, that I think mm -hmm. is, is going to come up. And, and by the way, I'm glad, Joey, that you went back to 14 because we do have a primary, a Republican primary there. Now, this one, you know, this is the first one where I can say this. Usually uh, we say this much earlier in the list, but, but Bina Shah, who ran last time, mm -hmm. uh, running off the line for assembly in the Republican primary, she filed with 113 signatures. Yeah. Uh, so, so. So I would say that this one is going to get challenged, except that you've got a Republican organization that that doesn't necessarily do that. that they don't they don't they don't have that type of, of infrastructure to be able to challenge it. So we'll we'll we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, but uh, I don't I don't I don't necessarily see a compelling reason why an off the line candidate you know, ought to be, you know, unless you raise a lot of money, we'll see, we'll, we'll revisit it. But, but that's, that's just, you know, there's probably not a lot of there there in terms of this race. But she did uh, say something kind of interesting to me when I, when I met her today, which is basically, you know, I stepped up and ran in 2019 when nobody cared about this district. I stepped up and ran in 2021 when nobody cared about this district. Now people care about this district and I'm off. 
that was basically, I mean, she said it in different words, obviously, but that was kind of the crux of her point. And I think, I thought it was kind of an interesting point of yeah. there are candidates in these safe districts who are not the strongest candidates. And even they would probably be willing to admit that, but they're sort of the foot soldiers of the party and of democracy in these districts sure. where, when no one else is really stepping up. But then yeah. the problem is, if the, if the party decides that a district is worth focusing on, those people are oftentimes not the people who they turn to. And so then it's sort of, you end up with situations like Bina Shaw, who says, well, what the hell? Well, maybe maybe she's talking about Gil Martin and Elias, her her primary challengers. But um, Pat Johnson has certainly been around. Um, you know, she's a she's a candidate who's run before in Mercer County. Um, she's part of what you're saying, where, you know, when we need a choice on the ballot, she's provided that choice. Yeah. And, you know, and so let's go, let's go to, go to 16, you know, I mean, potentially competitive in a general leaning democratic, not, you know, not, you know, no primaries. Yeah, not David, like, before David, can I apologize? Can we look at 15 for just a second? It sure. looks like only one Republican files for the assembly in that district. Yeah. Is that the first district we've come across where there's a missing candidate? I guess it is. Yeah. yeah we'll see that. And, and I remind I'll remind people that are watching this that haven't done this for, for, you know, you know, you know, you know, going back to the ancient times that Mike and I remember, but, but, you know, it, it happens time to time. They candidates, parties don't get their act together mm -hmm. by filing day. So they've got to run a, a writing campaign. So the reminder to everybody who doesn't know this, uh, the writing campaign can only be won, not by getting the most votes, but you must get at least the number of votes that you would have need, needed by petition to get on the ballot, right? Uh, which is a hundred. So you know it shouldn't be that hard. But but you know I've seen people struggle with with that before too. Uh, so we got some primaries in Middlesex. You know again not and and I apologize. And I'm usually you know better with names, but but Joey, the guy who was running against Pappas in the primary. Didn't file. Jeff Grant. So, yeah. yeah. I, he, he's one of several primary challengers that just wasn't. I mean, another one was Ashley Lamb in one of the ocean districts. Yeah. She, yeah. When, when she lost the convention, told me that she was undecided about whether she was continuing her campaign. Yeah. I never heard from her again. I don't know if she specifically said anything before, but she didn't file either. There are a few other candidates like that. I think Chairman Gilmore had something to do with that, but, but probably, yeah. But, but, um, but yeah, so Jeff Grant was a guy who had filed with, at least with ELEC. He had like filed a campaign account with ELEC. Mm -hmm. He had run in 2021. It was sort of unclear whether he was running again this year. I guess the answer is no. Yeah. So that means Mike Pappas is going to face Andrew Zwicker again. Uh, that was the matchup that we had in 2021. We're seeing it again this year. Some right. different candidates right. down ballot, but it's it's to some extent a repeat of a race. Yeah. I mean, so so uh, uh, Pat Dagnan in the 18th district of Middlesex County has a uh, uh, an opponent uh, by the name of, of Christopher Benetti. Uh, uh, you know, again, I apologize for being disrespectful. Well, I'll say it one more time. Christopher Benetti, do I need to ever say this name again? You may not because he's got 102 signatures. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> probably, probably end his bid before it really begins. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, and, and that tells something, you know, that somebody who doesn't understand how to do this, you know, and, 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 you know, that's just how it is. Uh, 20, we've got some primaries, uh, but I, I there's also quickly, there's a primary in 19, um, right. which is yeah. Michelle Burwell is challenging yeah. Joe Vitale. She has 200 signatures, so she'll make it onto the ballot. Um, yeah. but I've looked into her a little bit and I mean, it doesn't seem like this is a campaign that is going to make Joe Vitale really sweat again, who knows, but there's, th there's not a ton of indication that this is going to be all that into the primary, but it is one of the few cases where you have someone who just, you know, without any particular slate or grudge or anything like that is just, I'm going to run for the Senate. Right. And Joe Vitale has not, you know, he has not lost the primary since 1976. Mm. Uh, when he was a Mo Udall delegate candidate oh so, at age 20. So that's his, his last loss. Uh, you know, the, the claim to fame in that race is not is not who he lost to, but who he beat, uh, which was a 22-year-old delegate candidate uh, uh, for for a pro-life Democrat named Ellen McCormick named Christopher Smith. Uh, Joe Vitale is the only living Democrat to, <laughs> to have uh, beaten Chris Smith ever. So. <laughs> So, you know, just little footnote, but I'll, I'll tell you, you know, this, 
if you'll, you, you'll, everybody will indulge me, you know, especially you two who indulge me a lot and thank you for it. You're, you're both good friends that way. But, but this is one of my grievances with the system, which is just because you can go out and get enough signatures to get on the ballot doesn't make you a candidate. It doesn't mean anything other than the fact that you had the willingness to go door to door or stand outside a shop, right. Or, or you had a bunch of friends over to your it's house. I'm sorry. No, never mind. Oh, okay. uh, I just said so, $50 gift cards. This is the district. This district includes Perth Amboy, which yeah. is where there was uh, oh, wow, yeah. a gift card uh, for, for vote by mail. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> Too soon. But, but, yeah. you know, the, the, but so, so just because somebody's on a ballot doesn't make them a candidate. And, and I can tell you, you know, and this is, this is, this is one of the things that, that the media deals with all the time is, is you can't cover everybody. And, you know, and, and, you know, I can tell you, unless, unless there's a reason to believe that Michelle Burwell is anything more than a, you know, than a, than a, you know, a, a, a nothing candidate. I mean, she's, she's got to raise money. Or she's got to show some major endorsements. Some groups have to come in, uh, but this is going to be nothing. This is going to be nothing. Uh, so Joe Vitale, if you're watching, you can you can sleep well tonight. I wouldn't, you know, I. I I'm sure he'd been very stressed if he hadn't said that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, he's still having, you know, if you know Joe Vitale, he's still having nightmares over 1976. He does. <laughs> the, guy, the guy does not like to lose. So, so then you get to 20. Joey, explain what's going on in 20 because I think you wonder. I think you understand the Democratic side well. Yeah. So basically, it's so this is Joe Cryan, Re Reginald Atkins, and Annette Quijano running for re-election. They yeah. have a, an entire slate of challengers. And one thing that I noticed immediately about these challengers is that all three of them listed addresses in Roselle. What else is happening in Roselle this year? Former Assemblyman Jamel Hawley, who challenged Joe Cryan last year, or not last year, two years ago, is trying to regain the mayor's office. Right. And so this strikes me immediately as... A, an attempt by Jamel Hawley to have a full slate as he runs specifically in Roselle. Um, and these three candidates, Angela Alvey Wimbush, Charles Mitchell, Merlene Fellot. I mean, I can't imagine uh, Jamel well, Hawley is, too. I can't imagine Jamel Hawley is upset about the idea of giving Joe Cryan a black eye with like running challengers against him. But the point here is to have a complete he won't. slate. He won't. I think. he won't. And, 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 you know, he's also got a, a county commissioner candidate, so that will anchor. That means that, that means the potential to have the best call on the top to bottom. Yeah, yeah. There now needs to be a draw, and and you know I'm going to ask. Uh, you know I, I I I'm going to I'm going to break break in at this point and and just give a pop quiz. Uh, uh, can any of you tell me how many counties there are in New Jersey? How many? How many what? How many counties there are in New Jersey? Twenty one. This that wasn't a trick question. Can anybody tell me? I really thought it was going to be. That's why I didn't say anything. Uh, no, it's not. Can anybody tell me uh, uh, how many counties did not release the names of who filed today, uh, but that uh -oh. are keeping it secret? And can anybody identify who that county clerk is? The I only think, county clerk in the state who doesn't. I, think I know where this is going. Yeah, yeah, who doesn't feel the need to tell anybody. Who's on the ballot? That should be, you know, if this, I can tell you, I'm, 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 I'm mocking it a little, but don't take away from the fact that it shouldn't take away from the fact that, that, that is, that is, is not right. If there's anything that should be transparent, it's who has filed to run for office. Uh, and, uh, you know, none of you have guessed, I think, you know, oh, you know, I know. <laughs> I'm just keeping my, my mouth shut, but I know you're talking about Nancy. You Pinkham. want the big finale here. So just do it. <laughs> I did, but I did, but but I, I got to tell you, it's it's not right. And and the other thing that needs to to get fixed, as long as I'm, um, you know, as long as tonight's a little bit of festivus and I'm I'm airing some grievances, is it is it is maddening to call munis several municipal clerks' offices to find out who filed and not be able to get answers. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that that's something that there's a discussion about. That's that's just wrong. First of all, filing deadlines at four o'clock. That doesn't mean that you get to take the petitions at four and then leave. There the, the should be, be some transparency there. I can tell you that I have been on the phone with several municipal clerks office. And most of the municipal clerks in the state in New Jersey are, are terrific. 
but there are some that are just unnecessarily rigid. And, and I'm told, I'm told that I need to Oprah file an Oprah to find out who has filed petitions to be on the ballot. Uh, I, I had been asked in the past, uh, one clerk asked me, why do you need to know? Hmm. I said, well, I don't need to tell you why I need to know. Well, I'm not going to give you the name until you tell me why, you know, there, there, it, it, that needs to be fixed. There needs to be some ability for the public to know who's running for office immediately. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, tremendous praise, tremendous praise to Secretary of State Tahisha Way, mm -hmm. uh, Division of Elections. They have been updating that list of candidates multiple times through the weekend, yeah. through today, every day last week and the week before. Uh, they did a really job. Yeah, they've, they've done it. I, and that's across I, I, the board. I mean, I think we, we would all agree with that. I mean, you know, in the run up to the election, we get the reports every day that we can look at and, you know, can update. And that that comes through the state. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah there's a commitment to transparency there. Fol folks have got to have, you know, a right to know who's running for office. And and by the way, the statute uh, and I'm not a lawyer, although I pretend to 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 be one in, in matters dealing with Title 19. Uh, but but the intent of the statute is a very limited window in which to file a challenge. And if people sit on this information too long, that window will expire. And and that is troublesome. Uh, anyway, okay, I'm, I'm done with that. Uh, Union County, nothing to see yet beyond the 20th. Uh, you know, we I mean, get- The 21st is a district that on paper is very competitive, but yeah. Democrats have a slate that is that does not tell me that they're super interested in com competing for it. Not terribly, no, and some good people but, running, but but this right. is not you know this this is not you know this is not the kind of, of slate you'll see if they decided they were going to target this race. But, Which I think that they will eventually target this district. They're going to have to because the math just actually, this district, yeah. even as the, like no matter what the political environment, this district just keeps on inching bluer and bluer and bluer. This is the mm -hmm. ultimate sort of Tony suburb, like. Clinton or um, to Romney to Biden type voter. Mm -hmm. And at some point, Democrats are going to really make a play to break through. They did once in 2019. At some point, they're going to do it again. This year does not seem to be that year. Yeah, yeah Matt Marino, you know, he could be he could be challenged with 118 signatures on the ballot. Right. His petition. Right. And he's you know, he's he is by what people tell me, uh, a good candidate. Uh, but but he's getting dangerously close to being, you know, the, the, the P word, uh, you know, somebody who, who runs frequently and, and you don't want to be tagged as a perennial candidate. And he's, I think he's lost three races uh, for Burnersville council and, 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 and one for, you know, he ran last time and uh, for the assembly and then got out. So, you know, you gotta be careful sometimes too. Uh, 23. I mean, I wouldn't spend any time on this other than, then Roger Bacon, drain the yeah. drain the swamp in Trenton now. He's back. He's back, and you know, unless unless Raj Parikh is is somehow you know paid to to do something about it, he 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 may just survive. But this is just like I mean, I, I this is just one of the weirdest candidates. I I remember Roger Bacon when he when he ran against uh, you know you know back when he ran against Scott Garrett as a uh, oh my gosh. you know. He was 2008, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, our our friend Matt Friedman at the time, you know, he he remarked that uh, uh, Bacon's opponent in a Democratic congressional primary was a rabbi. And so you had a rabbi versus Bacon, which, you know, you know Matt, Matt enjoyed probably better than the rest. But but, you know, what's interesting about Roger Bacon is this is a Democrat who is, you know, who says I made a mistake running against Scott Garrett. He's a great man. We should have more people like Scott Garrett, uh, you know, openly pro-Trump Democrat, not what you want to put a Democrat in the heaviest of quotes. You could yeah, say you're but, a Democrat. If your website yeah. talks about the COVID mind virus and the Joe Biden's globalist cabal. I, uh, uh. Big, big 10 party, Joey. That's all I have to say. It is a, <laughs> it's the a largest big, tent you have ever seen. Yeah. So let, let's go to to one of the best assembly races in the state. Uh, and we were, uh, we were deprived of the best Senate race in the state. I, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, Matt Rooney and I, you know, are, are, are 
co-moderating an assembly debate. We were looking forward to Parker's space against Steve Lonigan. Uh, right. You know, quite frankly, I'd have I'd, I'd have liked to have done the first debate on April 1st, and I'd have liked to have done every night an hour with Steve Lonigan and Parker Space throughout. I think that I think that would have been 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 an interesting conversation. Uh, but, but you've got you've got a real primer here. I mean, this is you know, and and where lines are not as important. Uh, right. And and I think this one can go either way. I mean, if it's you know in in term and this. There, there should be no mistake to to anybody, you know, uh, this this is the election. I mean, this is this is a, a Sussex, a little bit of Western Morris and, and two towns in Warren. This is this is the election. I mean, whoever wins this primary is going to the state assembly. You know, no, no offense to the you know, the Democrats. They're going to go give it a good fight there. But that's what makes this primary important. And and, you know, District three, we're going to have a prime and four. We're going to have a primary and a general here. Just the primary. So this is the race. Right. And I don't know how to handicap it for, uh, you know, for four good candidates uh, for people. I mean, Josh, you know, you've got you've got Dawn Fantasia, who's won countywide in Sussex. You've got Jason Sarnowski, who's a Warren freeholder, who's been work in Sussex. He, he, he's teamed up with Josh Akins, uh, mm -hmm. who, who has built a, a tremendous base out of Sussex County. And Mike and Ganimore, you know, uh, uh, you know, I guarantee you, I will read some, uh, I will read some analysis of this race the week before the primary in a, in a newspaper owned by a chain that starts with a G uh, with, with stock prices that are, you know, not doing well. Uh, and I will see a headline that will tell me, here's everything you need to know about the 24th district race. And they will say that in Gannamore comes from Morris County, which is only 25% of the district. And, and, and I'm pointing out right now, you know, in Gannamore comes from Sussex mm -hmm. County committeeman in Sparta when he was 20, he worked mm -hmm. for Scott Garrett for 10 years and then he moved to Morris County where he's become mayor. You've got, you've got, this is, you know, regardless of where you stand on issues or anything like that, this is a good primary because these are four real candidates uh, that are going to sink or swim based upon the, the type of campaign they run. And as you, as you alluded to, Sussex does not award a county. They don't use the county line system. Uh, one of the only counties that don't. Morris does. Um, as you say, 25% of the district, Fantasia and Ignatimore will have um, the county line, um, but uh, not in the lion's share of the district where it's, every, it's every, anybody's game. And I think this is an interesting primary because it's maybe the only Republican primary in the state where the stakes feel primarily ideological. Um, you know, a lot like a big part of the fight in the third and fourth district, I'm sure that the and and also the 26th district, will, which we'll get to, I'm sure the candidates will find ideological differences with one another. But the starting point is personal rivalries and county rivalries and et cetera. In this district, I think that you genuinely have Don Fantasia and Mike Inganamore in a mold that New Jersey has sent to the assembly many times of conservatives who are still, you know, within this sort of like well-mannered you know, Lane versus I can Josh Eikens and Jason Sarnowski, who would be, especially Josh Eikens, among the most conservative, if not the most conservative members of the legislature if they were elected. And mm -hmm. so I, I think it remains to be seen whether those kinds of differences will really register with voters or whether they'll they'll treat it more as, well, Don Fantasia is my county commissioner, well, Mike Ganamore is my mayor, et cetera. But you know, in a, in a state that oftentimes has very few primaries that are based primarily on ideolo ideology, unlike a lot of other states where that's a frequent dividing line, this primary is sort of unique. I agree. You don't have Clifford Case is not running in this primary. And it's and, and, and Joey, I think you may have just cut an ad for two of the candidates, uh, you know, that, that uh, I know. And I tried to phrase that in a fair way, because I think yeah, that Don Fantasia yeah. and Megan Gannermort are perfectly conservative. Yeah, but, I don't, don't want to sort of do a hack job on that. If I were Jason Josh, I would, use, I would use this clip and say, see, Joey Fox, you know, respected pundit, says they will be among the most conservative members of the legislature. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and that's, 
That's what people are looking for. That's a credential, and, yeah. And I'll tell you, you know, I've watched Steve Lonigan since the 90s, and he, he's got an op-ed up on the New Jersey Globe now that explains why he didn't run. But but one of the things that he was not able to do, and, and I think he's figured this out, is it was really hard to paint Parker's space as a rhino. I mean, it just yeah, it's, run to the right of them. Yeah. It's, it just wasn't. It, it was. It was tough to make that a credible argument, mm -hmm. uh, and and I think that that was probably very frustrating. Uh, but this race, you know, so now you know now you're looking at you know where are these the races in the state, and you're you know you've you've got you've got the Gloucester neighborhood primaries in in three and four, and you have uh, now you have the these two to Western Jersey, the Morris Sussex primaries, uh, uh, you know, that are, that are something to watch. I mean, this, you know, so you've got, you know, 26 is, I mean, it's going to be in take no prisoners. Another one where there's, there's two tickets, I, not a complete ticket because there's, there's not a County clerk candidate, but you've got, you've got a, a candidate for County commissioner on each slate and you have, uh, uh, you have Joe Pinaccio, uh, uh, and Tom Mastrangelo, uh, Pinaccio has, has been a, a strong vote gooder over the years, okay. chaired Donald Trump's campaign in New Jersey, hard mm -hmm. to make him, uh, look anything other than a conservative, but you have Tom Mastrangelo who is running, trying to position himself to the right of Joe Pinaccio, not easy to do, but right. Mastrangelo has shown that he can, he went off the line last time. He yes. he went to his convention as an incumbent. He lost and came back and won that primary. So, you know, it's it's and, and then you've got you've got Jay Weber, who, you know, is is just gonna be incredibly hard to beat. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's again another one. It's hard to say. What are you gonna say? Weber's not. We could use somebody who votes a little more conservatively than Jay Weber. That's that's not gonna happen. You have Brian Bergen redistricted in. You know, which is his challenge running against Betty Lou DeCrosse, whose name ID has got to be pretty good. Uh, you know, uh, you know, and, and, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how to, you know, I, 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 I think the incumbents here might have a little bit of a leg up, but I don't know. I wouldn't, nothing would surprise me here. And they're, they're pensive, you know, they're raising a lot of money and they're, they're both running real campaigns. I, I, I agree with that. I do think that, um, I think that Panaccio is coming after Mastrangelo early and hard, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and taking nothing for granted and, uh, you know, going after his record as a commissioner. And so you could um, you could almost see some of those dings starting to have an effect on Mastrangelo. Mm -hmm. It's early days, but you could see that. And, you know, I think that Mastrangelo, Mastrangelo came off of the 2022 primary. You know, he he lost county support and then he won the he won the primary anyways. And I think that convinced him that he he can just always win off the line. Um, and like I won't I won't downplay that, that his victory off the line in 2022 is very impressive. Mm -hmm. But I also think now he is in that case it was an open seat against a candidate with some vulnerabilities that in a primary that he could pretty clearly exploit. He doesn't really have that here. the The county com county committee members rejected him really handily. He got mm -hmm. not much of the county committee vote. And I think that it is incumbent on him to prove that this is mm, this is a hyper competitive race. I don't know if I necessarily agree with you, David, that I think it's super, super this or that right now. I think that this is clearly advantage Panaccio, advantage incumbent slate until the challenger slate can show exactly why it is that they can win this. So two, two other things I'll, I'll point out about the 20, uh, the 26. One, one is, is Master Angela did run for the assembly two years ago and came in fourth in that primary with Kristen Baranko right, yeah. and Betty Lou right. uh, came in third. So right. but, but then again, you know, you you told, there is something to being uh, on the ballot. Uh, you know, uh, he was on the ballot in what 19, 21, 22, 23. Right. right. Yeah. But uh, but the, the, the again. Yeah. I'll tell you I'll tell you the 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 I think what what maybe may, maybe could be the a major point in this primary is Joe Pinaccio has hired Bill Stepien's firm and Bill Stepien knows how to create a, a, a Republican base candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, 
that can that can excite people and, and move them out. And Stepien is, you know, he's very, very smart and very methodical and focused and doesn't like to, to lose. And, you know, and he's got he, 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 uh, he's got Tom Bonfanti from Ocean County, who's who runs his New Jersey operation. Uh, you know, this is this is not Joe Pinaccio you know, just sort of right. winging it anymore on his own. This is, it's going to be a real professional campaign. And, that's- and it's going to be quick. And, and Master Angelo is going to have to get off the ground because otherwise he's going to get buried by the on- onslaught. Yeah. So, so now we go to district 27, which, you know, and it'll be, you know, that this is, you know, we always knew there was going to be, we knew this a year ago, there's going to be a primary because you put two incumbent democratic senators in the same district you know, here here we are now, what, like 13 months after we did one of these marathon live streams talking about the map. Uh, you know, you know, I think, you know, none of us ever thought it would be anything other than a primary. Uh, I mean, I don't think there were any. <laughs> the three of us did not think that either was going to blink or step aside. There was this, you know, open flirtation, you know, with with. Prince Charles McKeon about maybe actually running for the Senate instead of waiting to have it handed to him. But yeah. that, that didn't happen. Uh, and, uh, and then you had, you had a big deal this weekend, Tom Giblin. I mean, just, just a legendary figure in, in New Jersey politics. And he, he, uh, uh, he decided on, on Saturday uh, that he was going to retire Uh 18 years. And now you've got, you know, Alex and Colossos Gill, uh, the wife of Essex County Commissioner Brendan Gill, Montclair, Democratic Municipal Chairman, uh, you know, the, you know, one of two people uh, in the state now who have run uh, two statewide, was winning statewide campaigns. The other is Michael Solomon. And, mm-hmm. and in, in that, that race got put together. I mean, fast, like, like you know, you know, uh, within a she couple of five hundred signatures, and they had like a day yeah. to do it. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and that's that's Montclair. I mean, Montclair is, you know, it's it's not a club, it's not a group, it's an organization, and and that's what you look at in these primaries is whether you have you have a uh, an organization behind you. So you've got you've got two slates now. Uh, and you, so you've got, you know, you've got Cody McKeon and Colossus Gill on one, and then you have Gill and Eve Robinson, no slouch of a candidate in Montclair. She's mm-hmm. on the school board. She's, she's got a little bit of a base there. Uh, you know, and then you have, you have a, a she, Gill recruit. I, I gotta say, I've got to, first of all, I've got to figure one thing out and I don't, I don't know where it is, which is, which is, you got a lot of Gills on the ballot this year. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and the gills are going to spend some money and, and, you know, you know, Micah, you, you tell me about voter sophistication, you know, you know, when you say vote for gill or voters going to, I don't know how you do this. And it's going to be interesting. Oh, yeah, to work. Gil. Or I mean, Bre- Bre- Brendan should just change his last name to be hyphenated. He should be yeah. Brendan, <laughs> Gil. Brendan Colossus Gill. Which I, think <laughs> Al- I think Allison will like that. I think a lot of Brendan's yeah. friends will like that. Too. He put Gill in her name. Why can't he put Colossus in his name? Yeah. Yeah. Let's you know what, you know what, Joey, and, and I will say this, you know, as, as, as the, the, the younger single guy here, one thing you learn about politics is don't get into somebody's marriage. That's that's probably probably good advice. So you know, but with that okay, said, I will. I'll refrain you know, from my last name advice. I will. I will <laughs> definitely use that because because it's funny. But but the Mike, the reality is this, right? I mean, you're gonna have you're gonna have people saying vote for Gill. Yeah. And and you know, Cody's not gonna be happy about that. No, I, you know, I, I think you're right, but I but I think. Um, it's going to be vote for the county line versus the renegades. I mean, that's really, I don't think there'll be a lot of confusion. There's the potential. It's the hyphenated name, but you know, you're going to look for the county line versus not. Um, And uh, you know, look, we've said this many times before. Nia Gill has beaten the line before Dick Cody has beaten the line before. And so they both know how to do it. The question is, um, is Nia at the point of, her peak abilities to be able to do that is 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 she at the 
peak organizational uh, strength and the peak personal strength in in the point in her career where she has the uh, the ability to um, to to fend off an an energized uh, organization line. Yeah, and I'll, I'll I'll be bolder here than I have on, on some of these others. I mean, Cody is going to win easily. He is, you know, he he he's he's been, you know, you know, you know, you know, and and and, and I say this nicely. You know, some people some people in politics, you know, see ghosts once in a while, and Cody has kept money. He's kept. He's been raising. He's been waiting, preparing for this day just in case. He's got nearly a million dollars in the bank. Uh, she, she, she has, you know, a couple thousand dollars that I know of. Of course, you know, I don't know what she's been doing in the last two months of fundraising. Uh, I don't think this one's going to be close. I mean, yeah. I think it's going to be interesting to talk about. I don't think it'd be close at all. She hasn't really had to run for office very much over the years. And, uh, uh, you know, and I, I don't, I, I don't know if the two of you you're both obviously free to disagree, but, but no, I, I think you're right. I think it's, it's good. Right. So, Joey, there was a surprise today at filing day. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I sort of I made a little bit of an ass of myself because so I th- there is an, an extra candidate in this race, Craig Stanley, who's a former assemblyman. And, you know, I spent all day waiting outside the division of elections and I would talk to people. And, you know, I would, just have, I would always have to make split second decisions when somebody told me who they were in terms of how to react to them. Because, yeah. you know, did you, like, remember him? Did you know the name? Yes, I did. I did faintly recognize the name. I've written about him sort of in past tense before. Um, But, you know, so like I would be talking to somebody and in some cases it would be a Republican running in a D plus 60 district. And, you know, I'd want to talk to that person. I'd be interested in in hearing what they have to say. But it's also that's a different situation than a former assemblyman running to reclaim. Well, it's not even he's not even really reclaiming his seat. This is a different seat than the one he used to represent. So this is there's not a town in this district that he ever represented. No. Yeah, so this is Craig Stanley represented a Newark-based seat. He's from Irvington originally. He represented a, run here. Yeah, he represented a Newark-based seat for 12 years, lost a primary in 2007 to Cleopatra Tucker and Ralph Caputo. Mm-hmm. Now, and he's run a couple of other unsuccessful campaigns since then. And then 3.45 p.m. today, there he is at the <laughs> Division of Elections talking to me. I don't know who he is for the first two minutes. And then I <laughs> sort of, he helps me piece it together. I'm like, oh, okay. And so, yeah, so, I mean, I... I have a tough time believing given how much oxygen in this race is already being devoted to like the big Cody versus Cody plus Gill versus Gill fight. Um, I have a tough time believing that he'll really be able to break through in a district that he, ha- he has not represented before, but he certainly adds an interesting factor to it. You know, he, he does have experience running campaigns before, including several difficult ones on and off the line. So it's definitely an intriguing component to add. A member of the Payne family. Yep. It's absolutely. Yes. He is. He is he is the the first cousin of a congressman. He's the nephew of a congressman. He is the mm-hmm. the nephew of of former assemblyman William Payne. They serve uh, together, yeah. In his nineties and still, you know, a mm-hmm. top advisor to Joe DiVincenzo. I mean, this this to be clear, one, family is not in his nineties. He's in his sixties. No, no, his, <laughs> right, this, but I'm talking about his <laughs> uncle. But this is yeah, yeah. This was this is an organization guy. This is not you know right. This is not a rebel, but you know, again, you know, I, you know, he's, he's uh, you know, you, you, you wish him well, but uh, there's nothing to see here. Right. right. There really isn't. And, 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 you know, district 28, you know, Joey and I have, have been debating district 28. You've got, uh, this is where, this is where Ralph Caputo has left and, and the Democrats picked Garnell Hall, who's, the deputy county clerk, the vice chair of the this, this isn't Ralph Caputo who's leaving this seat technically. This is right. mileage. Thirty four. You're right. You're right. And this yeah. was. Uh, There's some reshuffling in Essex that made several incumbents yeah. move to different seats, and right. coincidentally, this, most of those incumbents right. are retiring. Right. This is the mileage JC seat. This yeah. is the mileage JC seat, mm-hmm. and, uh, and and so you've you've got you've got an off the line candidate named uh, named Frank McGee, who used to be the mayor of Maplewood. Uh, well liked in his town, well liked in South Orange, uh, but he's he's off the line, and and you know Essex is one of those places where where you know you can be off the line if there's a split in the organization, and you know you know well I'm off the line, but I have Steve Adubato with me or something like that, or mm-hmm. you know you know but uh, uh, 
this is different. And this is, you know, you know, I, Joey and I have talked through some of the numbers. I wonder what would happen if Maplewood and South Orange, which are, are huge, potentially huge turnout towns. Mm -hmm. If they, if they really turned out and if they, you know, and if, if, you know, if, 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 if McGee, uh, uh, was able to do very well there. You know, I, I wondered whether whether it could be him and Garnett Hall and Cleopatra Tucker could be, you know, left without a seat. Joey, you don't and agree my counter with to that is yeah. I did the calculations for the 2021 Democratic prime, gu- gubernatorial mm-hmm. primary. And that's just one primary, but yeah. I think it paints a pretty clear picture, which is that Maplewood and, and uh, South Orange, they had higher turnout than the rest of the district, but, but they still, they're small enough that they only made up about 30% of the district overall. Yeah. So yeah. if McGeehee's strategy is, in fact, to just win Maplewood and South Orange by a lot, even if he can do that, that's not going to be enough. Because you're going to be getting you know, Cleopatra Tucker and Garnett Hall, just by virtue of being on the county line, are probably going to be getting 80 or 90 percent of the vote in Newark and Irvington. Because there's not right. a ton of reason to think they won't. And so if they turn that, out, if they turn out, you know, you, you know, you're still talking about. But they don't even need to turn out that much because they're just big enough yeah. that they don't need to turn out all that much for them to provide a pretty overwhelming advantage. So until I see something from the McGeehee campaign that tells me that he can bring down those margins in Irvington and Newark or create some kind of turn differential, the likes of which the world has literally never seen, then I'm a little skeptical. Right. What's the compelling reason for people to do that, to come out for him? The, the assembly race doesn't generally generate that kind of enthusiasm to drive voter turnout in the primary. It would, be, it would be a surprise to me. But I mean, you know, anything can happen. You also see that Tucker and Hall, just as an organizing exercise, have like four times the number of signatures that he did. You know, so, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, not for whatever little that's worth. Well, and, you know, you know, it's a good lesson here, which is, you know, I, I, I always just sort of scoffed at these, these people that go out and just, just, you know, overkill on their petitions. And then I, I, I got an education uh, from a guy who's pretty good at grassroots politics named Brian Stack. Yeah, yeah. And, and I remember a couple of years ago saying, you know, like, what are you doing? Like, what do you, what do you need to have? What do you need to have 6,299 signatures on a petition, which is 6,199 more than he needs? Like, what's it for? And, and Brian Stack went into a, a, a very strong argument about you don't let your organization atrophy. You build an organization and you give them things to do and you give them things to do all the time. And this time of year, there's nothing really for them to, to do. Uh, but they, you know, you need to make sure that, that you do that. So stack says, well, let's go out and let's, let's just get a huge number of signatures. And, and, you know, and I, I will, you know, I, I, I hope I don't embarrass him in saying this because you know, that Brian stack is, is like running this all himself. Right. I mean, it's not like, it's not like he hired a consultant to go get it. And then he, he, he calls somebody this morning and says, okay, how many do we have? Right. You know, stack is all over this. And what he does is he gives out petitions to all these district leaders, all these people in the organization, and he gives them quotas. And he says, you need to get me, you know, you know, you know, I need you to get 20 signatures on this petition. I need you to return it to me uh, in February. And if it's not back and he's looking at it and, you know, and again, you know, I, I hope I don't embarrass him, but this is, this is why he is the best of the best when it comes to, you know, the combination of old school and, and the way to run a campaign, he will look at a petition and he'll say, well, you know, where's Joey Fox? He lives in your building. He's not on here. And mm-hmm. I know he supports me. Why isn't Joey Fox on my petition? So this is Brian Stack's way of having metrics. This is his way of testing his organization, because if a person can't meet their quota on a petition, then what's he going to do when it comes election day and they've got to do turnout? So, you know, I I have to tell you, Brian Stack changed my mind on how I view these petitions. I now look at it more seriously because it does say something about about the organization. Uh, So I just did a quick calculation and one fifth of all signatures turned in for all legislative districts across the entire state we're from Brian Stack's slate in the 33rd district. Wow. I don't know why I'm surprised. I don't know why I'm surprised. This is this is why he does as well as he does. Yeah. 
you know, yeah. because he, you know, and I, and uh, I'm not going to, I could pull out a, uh, you know, I, I, I've got a letter that, that was sent to me recently that he sent out to voters uh, uh, saying, you know, I was looking at the turnout from my 2022 race and I realized you didn't vote. You know, I, this is how, this is how I can, you know, this is my report card. This is how people judge me by voting. Yeah. You know, what have I, you know, what can I do to make you vote? In the yeah. future? Guys, it just, just look, this is a guy. That reminds me of Tip O'Neill. That's yeah. 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 I mean, just, just, you know, uh, it's kind of funny. It reminds me because it, 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 it's almost like Brian Stack is a New York politician. I'm, you know, I, I've, I've, before yeah. doing New Jersey politics, I was I was more invested in New York politics, where I'm from originally, and the the culture there, the signature gathering culture there, is extremely intense because the rules are pretty stringent, the thresholds are pretty high, challenges are brutal, and so you know a campaign that I worked on a few years ago um, was I think the threshold was a thousand signatures, and we were like we got like obviously we're going to get ten thousand to be safe, and our opponent also got like twelve thousand, and that's just that's just the way you do it. And so mm. this, this piddly little New Jersey signature requirement where people have to get a hundred and some people can't even do that. It's like, okay, <laughs> like try doing it in New York. Jeez. Look, I, you know, I, I, I have joked with people that if, if Cory Booker in his presidential race had hired, you know, Brian Stack and Phil Loggia and Sammy, Sammy Gonzalez to just go organize Iowa, he might be president today. Because could, you, could you imagine Brian Stack? I mean, we're going way off on a tangent here, but could you imagine Brian Stack in an Iowa caucus? Right. right. I could you imagine what that might have looked like. Uh, anyway, you know, paid for by the committee to reelect Brian Stack. I mean, it's, it, <laughs> you know, but so, so we go back, you know, we, we've done 28, you know, you know, and then you, you get into, you know, you, Essex, nothing more out of really 27, 28, yeah. you know, uh, uh, as we have known from the very beginning. Uh, that uh, that Brittany Timberlake is headed to the Senate. Uh, you know, she's she's going to take that seat. And then you get to Hudson County. And uh, uh, I mean, Joey, there's there's a primary in 31. It's the open seat. It's the Sandra Cunningham seat. I should point out uh, uh, that that with at four o'clock today was the first time we ever really knew for sure that Senator Cunningham wasn't running for re-election and, and, you know, and, and God, you know, we, we all wish her the very best. And she's, she's, you know, she, she's, you know, dealing with some tremendous challenges. And I am told by her friends that she is, is dealing with those challenges with, with a, a tremendous, tremendous amount of courage and dignity and grace, but she did not say she wasn't running again. And we all knew that she wasn't and everybody moved toward it, but, but four o'clock today was the signal uh, that she will not be returning to the Senate. So, I mean, Joey, you've been you know you've been watching this race closely. This is you know this is why don't why don't you just let's just go through quickly what we're looking at here. Well, I feel like I'll talk about all the districts in tandem, um, 31, 32, and 33. I mean, you're seeing both an extremely dramatic year in Hudson politics and like a very boring one at the same time because you really only got one legislator out of the nine legislators across the three districts. You've only got one who is really running for re-election in the district they currently represent. And that's uh -huh. William Sampson in the 31st. You've got yeah. Angela McKnight and Raj Mukherjee moving up to the Senate. You've got Brian Stack staying in the Senate, but Union City got shifted into basically just a different district. The only yeah. thing that's the same about his district is Union City. Everything else is going to be new pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got a lot of new assembly members. You've got Barbara McCann Stamato, who's coming in the 31st. You've got John Allen and Jessica Ramirez in the 32nd. You've got Julio Marenko and Gabe Rodriguez in the 33rd. There's a couple of those assembly, or, I mean, most of those assembly people who they're replacing are not leaving voluntarily. This is a engineered Hudson County yeah. shakeup. They wanted mm -hmm. everything to be different and they, they got their wish. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, nobody's really challenging them on it. I mean, Republicans are not gonna be a factor here. They didn't even file in the 33rd district. They've got candidates in the 32nd and 31st, but and, and two, two of the assembly candidates in the 32nd have 101 signatures. Yeah. Right. So that's just, that's I mean, honors. but, but yeah. that's, that means that Raj Mukherjee, you know, is, you know, you know, decides to go toss them and, and, you know, what does he care? Right. I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, right. You know, they're going to win huge numbers. Why? I feel like it's almost benefit. It's almost beneficial for them to 
beat a Republican by 80 yeah. points rather than just winning uncontested. It looks better. Yeah. The, the one race that does actually exist is the 31st District Democratic primary. You've got Michael Griffin, who is associated with the Jersey City Progressive Faction, running for Senate. He's got one running mate, Chanel Smith, um, who I don't think had been really reported on before today, but he, she filed as well with him. Yeah. Um, and, you oh, know, so it gives... It, it gives, it gives the list right now, this is the first time I've seen her name. Yeah, and it gives progressives somebody to vote for in that district specifically. Yeah. Um, and I don't think progressives have, have too much of an issue with uh, Raj Mukherjee or his running mate, so that's a little different. But, I mean... You know, this is ultimately going to be a little bit of shouting into the void, most likely. Progressives have demonstrated that they can win Jersey City Council races um, mm -hmm. and that they can they can play a role in some of these races. But I find it really hard to believe that this campaign is going to be able to bring down the Hudson Democratic Organization against some assembly or against some legislative incumbents who there's not a ton to attack them over. So, and this is. The thirty first is not where most of the progressives live. So no, you know. this this is the this is the more historically black part of Jersey right. City. This plus is the part, yeah. Plus it seems to me that this is another one of those situations where it's an open. It, it was going to be an open seat and uh, smelled an opportunity to jump in there and just you know got themselves organized and figured out what they were doing before the organization had really come out and said McKnight was going to get the uh, support. They just you know I mean it's almost like a lottery ticket. You know they were out there because they didn't know what was going on. Yeah, and this is you know I mean this is I, I don't think there's a lot of drama here. It's you know interesting to point out that you know you're going to see a lot of people talking about how you know uh barbara mccann's the motto is former mayor jerry mccann's sister uh but but you know you know we'll, we'll say it but this is a woman who has developed her own credentials over the years and she's had her own independent political career uh and uh, uh and and exceptionally loyal to the mayor of jersey city uh, Steve Fulop, you know, likely to run for governor. You know, look, the, I don't think there's, I think, I don't think there's any drama in this race. I will, I will, you know, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get, you know, in our little time machine now and, and jump ahead to 2027. Uh, if Steve Fulop, you know, Steve Fulop's not going to be the mayor, and if he's not the yeah. governor, uh, uh, if the new mayor of Jersey City wants a new senator, then Angela McKnight is is a one term senator. I mean, that's just the way this district is. And if Jimmy Davis wakes up one morning and decides I've had enough of William Sampson, uh, then, then William Sampson's gone. So, you know, you know, these are and this is what fuels progressives. And this is what fuels conversations from anti uh, anti line uh, uh, believers is is that this district more than any place else, uh, you're you know, you 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 have. You're essentially appointed by one person. This is carved out uh, where, you know, you, you'd almost be better off. You'd almost be more transparent if on the ballot in Bayonne every four years, the ballot said <laughs> mayor slash appointment. Assembly appointment. appointer. Yeah. Kind Assembly. of like an elector, right? You know, you're running for the electors instead of the presidential yeah. candidate. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. exactly, exactly what it is. So that's, you yeah. know, when we watch the lawsuit on the line, you know, you can be sure that some of these are going to be be examples. But I mean, look, you know, the you know, the 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 you know, there's there's no drama here other than, you know, or is is Brian Stack going to get 50 percent of all votes cast for all candidates in the primer uh, on both parties? I mean, this is just well, he doesn't have an opponent. So he's going to get 100 percent. Right. Well, and by the way, you know, not good enough for Brian Stack. I mean, you know, I you know, I that's why he goes out there. I. I remember seeing him after his 2010 re-election, and and he was, uh, uh, you know, we 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 were we were getting together, and he was a few minutes late. When I say a few minutes, I mean like like four minutes late. And he comes in, and he's apologetic beyond belief. Um, you know, because Brian Sack is old school. You know, you know, you know. That stuff matters. Yeah. Billy Musto, Bob Menendez. You know, when you have an appointment at 12 o'clock, that means 12 o'clock. Yeah, you know, does, and so Stack comes in and he says, I'm sorry, I was going door to door. And I said, what are you going door to door for? <laughs> the election was two days ago and, and you got a, you know, you got a hundred percent of the vote. He says, well, there are people who didn't vote. And I looked at him and I said, Mayor, you did 10 percent better, 10 points better than Brezhnev did the last time he ran. And you're not. And it's just that's just the way he's wired. And there's a lot of people wired that way. Uh, 
you know, you, you we'll go through Bergen, you know, I mean, you know, 35, one Senate candidate, no assembly candidates, right. Uh, 36, a rematch of, of the, the, the last campaign, but I mean, you know, you're not beating Paul Sarlo or Gary share, you know, or, or Clinton Calabrese in that district, uh, 37, in, in are they REMs? I assume they're related. Are they? They are brothers. Yes, they're brothers. There we go. Brothers, okay. Yes. Yeah. So we've got a brother team there. We've got a husband and wife team in the Democratic side in the twenty fourth district. I'm not right. sure if we've got any other relatives. Right. And and Colossus Guilford commissioner and Colossus Guilford assembly. So right. You know, we've we've got some of those. Uh, you know, thirty seven was you know was supposed to be one of the best primaries in the state two years ago. Uh, Gordon Johnson now unopposed. Uh, uh, you know, some of the numbers of Republicans in that district are on the low end. So, you know, we'll have to we'll have to watch petition challenges. Uh, I mean, I also so I, I had an extended conversation with one of the Republicans today, Robert Bedoya. You know, I don't want to I don't want to crap on, on, on random candidates who are stepping up to run. Yeah. But I will say that he was sort of an example of sometimes in these districts where you don't have a lot of candidates who are really interested in running because they don't have much of a chance. You get some people who are pretty outside the mainstream. I mean, this guy was, you know, his his he handed me his business card and it's got like a QAnon slogan on it. So, you know, mm. you, you sort of sometimes candidates in these districts where there's no real vetting process, because how could you even vet? There's there's one option. You end up with people who are a bit of a liability. And so I wonder if because this district famously in 2021 had multiple candidates who were affiliated with the Oath Keepers. Yeah. And that yeah. created a whole shit show I'll yeah um where it's like, internet show. you can say shit it's okay 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 it's gone to bed it's 10 36 yeah um, Deirdre, Deirdre Paul has a personal history there's a complaint that she made against Gordon Johnson at some point didn't she that's who's yeah, that's she, who's she accused him of harassment and she's yeah. run against him before right uh, you know and she she ran for county commissioner last time and mm -hmm. you know we'll, yeah. we'll 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 see where that goes but that is that's one of the districts in the state where uh, this district, the 37th was drawn in 1970, uh, in 1971 uh, as, 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 uh, as a subset of Bergen. I think, it, I think they, they called it 14 C or something. I don't remember the number, but, but. And the significance of that date, sorry. The yeah. significance of that date is because that's just when the legislature is starting to organize itself outside of the old county system. This is right. really after the six after one man, one vote. Exactly. Right. And so exactly. this per, this section of Bergen County, this this Englewood Teaneck sec, section has been, you know, has been fairly consistent in how it's been drawn over the years. Those two big towns are have been anchors and a Republican has never one there. I mean, God, even Todd Caligar couldn't win that in, in 1991. I mean, it was, uh, uh, it, it, it's tough terrain. So, you know, uh, and, and that that's just where it is. And 38, which was supposed to be a uh, competitive district, it still can be. They, they, you know, this is one of the recruitment uh, challenges. They, they had a guy who was uh, uh, Bob Kaiser, Paramus councilman, mm -hmm. Uh, basically it told Republicans he was in. And then at the last minute, right before the convention said, nah, and I changed my mind. And, and Guy Tallarico, former assemblyman said, no, they've now, they, they, they've now, uh, picked up a pretty good candidate in, 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 uh, Micheline, uh, Adier. And, uh, uh, you know, she doesn't run for office anymore, but she's, you know, she, 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 well, I shouldn't say that she was 21 years old. And nobody filed for a school board seat. And she mounted a writing campaign and I think won it by two votes. Hmm. Uh, and her mother was a councilwoman and her her brother became the chief of police. So she's got, mm -hmm. you know, you know, there's some skill sets there. You know, you've got, you know, this could be a, we'll talk about this more, you know, uh, as we get closer. But, you know, Barry Wilkes, a uh, uh, businessman from Glen Rock, uh, 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 father-in-law of, of Alex Wilkes, the uh, a Republican consultant and, and with Dan Bryan, one of the uh, uh, one of the co-authors of Stopping Grounds every week on, mm -hmm. on on the New Jersey Globe. I mean, he's he could be a good candidate there and we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, Thirty nine again, no primary materialized. Uh, uh, they 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 had some ups and downs. There were some, you know, 
There were some bumpy roads. Holly Shapizzi had a, uh, a candidate in against her in the, at the convention blew her away. I mean, just absolutely blew her away. Bob Roth did fine. Azaridi won against, uh, uh, I, I know, I'm shocked every time I think about it. I can't believe Todd Caliguire lost again, right? But but at the end of the day, there's no primary. You know, yeah, this, is sort of an interesting, this is sort of an interesting retribution. Eh, not, that's maybe a little bit too strong. But isn't it, so, you know, in two years ago, Holly Shapizzi narrowly won the Senate seat and then made a pretty concerted effort to get her friends in or her allies into the assembly and that didn't go well she tried to get <laughs> Azaridi in there she tried to get john kirpis in there and it didn't work you had bob Oth, you had dandy defuccio and that team was just not the most harmonious team ever mm -hmm. um and now this year after only two years dn defuccio is calling it quits and who should arise but john Azaridi. so holly shapizzi only needed to wait two years to get you know one of her top people into into her seat so she she and bob Oth are maybe not still the closest of all friends but it's definitely this is more of a Shapizzi ticket than it was before. I agree. I agree. And and I'll you know again I'm I, you know uh, I'm sure we'll hear more from our friend Matt Friedman on this. But uh, uh, John Azaridi will become the first anesthesiologist to serve in the New Jersey legislature, but not the first legislator to put people to sleep in that room. So, <laughs> so I, I think that'll. That'd be interesting to watch. And look, you know, then we get to District 40, no primary. And it, and it is it is appropriate to end a discussion about primaries under the new map uh, with a district right. where where, you know, one of the architects of the map, the Republican co-chair of redistricting, Al Barless, uh, has, you know, now finds himself with a clear path to a state assembly seat. Uh by complete and total coincidence, uh, Essex County picked up a bunch of extra little towns and suddenly Essex was deserving of a seat. Kevin Rooney not running again. Uh, uh, it was it was supposed to go to somebody else who decided not to run. And here's Al Barless. You know, uh, he drew this map. Uh, he got a lot of praise for it, de mm -hmm. de deservingly so. A a deal map uh, where he worked with Leroy Jones, and 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 look, I think, I think an appropriate close to to another one of our. You know, God, this one's gone longer than than we do when there's like lots mm -hmm. of general. We should count up who's who's done the biggest percentage of the talking. That'll be really insightful. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, here we go. Right here we go. But <laughs> but but you know, you look at the commissions. That have been, you know, you know, derived by the by the cartographers yeah. of this map. Leroy Jones, exceptionally well here. He's got right. got Brittany Timberlake headed to the Senate. He's already got Renee Burgess in the Senate. Two very strong allies. Barless is about to to get an assembly seat himself. So you know, it it's it just that's that's Jersey, and and Barless is Barless is good at this. He's going to be a uh, uh, you know, when you talk about a guy who's going to be able to sit in the legislature and play inside baseball, uh, you know, but but I'll tell you, I don't know why I'm even saying this because it is 1042. Uh, so we are, you know, we are over two hours, well, about two hours and 15 minutes into a uh, uh, into a, a live stream. And we lost Barless two hours ago. So, <laughs> so if you I me, just I, I find it interesting that with the new map which we have talked about that it's more competitive. I find it interesting that we are seeing many of the um, impacts of the map today, right? You know, we're seeing much of much of what the map is going to accomplish is has unfolded already with retirements and it's unfolding today. We're not going to see it with more competitive general elections. It's it's unfolding now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and there are parts of it that we like we didn't we have not mentioned the name Nick Sacco, but he is an incumbent state senator who has who is basically forced out of his seat by Brian Stack the way that the map was drawn. Um, mm -hmm. We barely mentioned Myla JC. The, the map significantly re redrew her district, which I would think was at least part of her decision to retire that her right. that she was about to shift to representing a totally different district. So there's all kinds of consequences like that. That yeah. and also one other thing that's not on that that I just want to very briefly mention because we didn't actually say this for 40, 39, or 25. These are all districts that were won by Joe Biden in 2020. And I know that that's not a great measure of how competitive things will be in New Jersey all the time. President and, and state level elections don't always match up. But it is interesting that, the, you know, those are districts where 
the partisan math does exist for Democrats to win. Yeah. But, you know, none of us really thought to mention the Democratic candidates. And that's because these are slates that, again, they they exist. They're all 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 three have nine candidates, each of whom mm-hmm. would probably serve well in the assembly in, in the legislature. But these are not districts that Democrats are putting a priority on um, so much so that we did not even mention them. So how New Jersey elections work is you have these districts that vote certain ways in certain years and then really differently in other years. Yeah, you, you made the really good point at the beginning. We, we can't write them off. We don't know what they are capable of producing. Right. these candidates. However, um, you would not look at these names and say, these are the people who are going to fundamentally shake up the normal profile of the turnout that happens in the off off year election cycle. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, Joey, Joey has been doing this, you know, many people may have seen it, this, uh, you know, every time a legislator uh, uh, announces a retirement, Joey's got the re- retirement tracker and it's, it's cumulative as we're, we're looking at it. And, but, but one thing that is worth mentioning is that, you know, there's retirements and there's retirements. Mm-hmm. And some people are leaving because, uh, you know, it's they, they you know, Chris Connors, you know, just ready mm-hmm. to go. Yeah. Uh, not every retirement is voluntary. Right. Uh, yeah. You've got a lot of people on that list where it says they're not seeking reelection, mm-hmm. uh, but but they have been. You know, either they lost the invisible primary is kind of. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. You know, either redistricting didn't go their way or 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 something has happened. And and, you know, we just have so many of those legislators this year who who are just, uh, you know, they're leaving. And and the record will reflect history will reflect that they didn't seek reelection. But that doesn't tell the full story of filing dead today. Yeah. Had, had, Had the map been different. Tom Giblin would not have had the seat fall out from under him. You know, he'd still be running. I mean, you know, obviously that's the case. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah. A lot, of, a lot of people are victims of the map for sure. And you, and yeah. Yeah. And, it, and the, the other thing to point out is, you know, when there's, there's great, there's, there, 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 there's, there's great struggles between the two sides on, on, on the, on the word diversity and, and about whether, you know, whether party leaders ought to set out to have a more diverse legislature or not, and yeah. how much they should put their, their their thumbs on the scale. But what we're seeing here, I mean, you, you look at this Essex delegation, you talk about a map, you know, the map that Leroy drew. And not only has he created a, uh, you know, what will be an Essex delegation that that has has people that are more his people than than not, but but you've got you've got you know, it is much more diverse. You have mm-hmm. uh, you know a majority of the Essex delegation uh, will be women. Uh, a majority of the Essex delegation, including Republican Al Barlas, will be people of color. A majority of the Essex delegation, you know, and, and it's true whether you include Barlas or you don't uh, uh, include Barlas, but a majority of the legislators that will serve representing Essex County next year will have been born after Dick Cody first took the oath of office as a member of the legislature. Uh, So what Jones has done here is he's taken Essex and he has, he's made it more diverse. He's made it younger. He's, he's built a delegation that is, you know, you know, also to his liking. So, you know, well, and hopefully for every other than Jones and Barless won the map. And and hopefully for every Gabby Mascara who, you know, the map is, you know, yeah. legislature's losing a uh, Hispanic female, um, you pick up a Tennille McCoy or or somebody, you know what I mean? So, you know, I mean, we will right. see. Alex, Alex Colossus Giller, yeah, but, right. and, and, I, and I gotta tell you, I, I, I can't tell you, I can't tell you how many progressives that I've spoken to about the fourth district who were like, you know, you know, give, let Gabby Mascara go. Give me a white guy who is who is pro-choice who will vote for reproductive mm-hmm. freedom. Mm-hmm. You know, I, you know, it, it's amazing. And I don't say this in a I don't say this, you know, as, as a as a is a is a good point or a bad point. It is an observation of what I have heard. 
uh, which is that, you know, uh, there are there are Democrats who would like there to be more women who would like to mm -hmm. see it be more diverse. Mm -hmm. But that does not compare to their desire to see a, a Democratic majority that's pro-choice. That's interesting. Also, you're losing uh, you're losing uh, you're losing Giblin. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Egan may be on this, may be much more isolated as far as the pro-life card right. goes. Going um, and you saw D'Angelo had a bit of a scare, and he's one yes. of the other abstainers on the. Yeah. Um, I mean, so one thing that, and David and I have had to, have talked about this in conversations: diversity, whether it be in the legislature or in other governing bodies or just in general, is a collective goal that has to be achieved through individual choices. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it's this sort of interesting thing where, you, when you talk about diversity in the New Jersey legislature, you are talking about as a whole. Okay, there's 35 percent women, or whatever it may be. But then in order to get a number, a higher percentage of women, then you have to look at Tom Giblin and say, OK, it's time to go. It's time that uh, a Latina woman will hold the seat mm -hmm. or something like mm -hmm. whatever. That's just a specific example. And I don't mean to single out those two people. Well, that's but been it's happening in Essex. That's the story of Essex for decades, right? That's, yeah. that, but that's just always the yeah. challenge in terms of if if your goal is diversity, that is a goal that you can only achieve statewide, but it's also a goal that you have to make conscious individual choices district by district. And sometimes the choice doesn't make sense. Sometimes the choice is, oh, well, but the one who's waiting, the guy who's waiting in line next is this really great white guy. And we just, we mm -hmm. think he's the best. And so we're going to put him in. And so then that, you know, those are always going to be in conflict. You know, in the, yeah. uh, um, um, uh, you know, we, we, we can close this this soon, but, but I, I will just, Essex has always put a premium on diversity and and what i mean by that is you know you go way way back you know you know way back to a time where people begin to you know you know gloss over when i talk about it but the you know the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s you know where at you know these big counties had at large assembly slates you know up till 47 they were one year terms they were like the flotsam and jetsam. If you're top of your ticket won, all these assembly candidates they either win or they lose. They didn't have independent identities. In Essex County, they had term limits. I mean, going back, you know, 60 years ago, they had term, you know, more than that, you know, 80 years ago, they had term limits. You got two terms, whether it was one, two one-year terms or then two two-year terms and you were out. And the county chairman would, they would keep a list and they would balance the ticket. You know, I remember, you know, I mean, you had a Presbyterian seat and then you had a second Protestant seat that rotated between the other Protestant denominations. You know, you had, you know, you would have, you know, a, a Jewish seat and and but every other time it had to be a German Jew. And then then Polish Jews or Russians or Austrians would have to intersperse there. They had a balanced ticket. There was a labor guy. There was an yeah. Italian. There was Irish. And they would work it. And you would spend, you know, years sitting on a county chairman's list. There are probably ways of moving your name up on a county chairman's list because it's not like, <laughs> I can't like those were posted or anything. Yeah. But in those old days, you know, when your turn came, if the guy at the top of the ticket, if it was a bad year, you know, if your turn finally came and Herbert Hoover was at the top of the ticket, well, that's it. You had your shot. You missed it. You didn't get to go to the legislature. You know, Carney, uh, Carney had an assembly seat under that old Hudson math where they had 10 seats. And the Carney Democrats decided everybody's going to have a term. And so one term limit. And you, you were from Carney and you get a one you get one year in the assembly, then you get two years in the assembly that continued to a point where, you know, I remember I remember hearing the story from some old timers. You know, you'd go to a, a Carney Democratic club meeting and they would introduce all, all the former assemblymen. And eventually it was everybody in the room had been an assemblyman. And it was you know, it was sort of that was their strategy, just spread the wealth. So, you know, diversity is not new. But yeah. in those days, it wasn't diversity because it doesn't look good. It was diversity of, well, this is how we're going to win an election because, mm -hmm. you know, we need all of these different constituencies to step up and contrib contribute votes when races were competitive. That was the, uh, the even more recently, um, 
Jamie Foxx's motto used to be, if you have to get rid of somebody, you replace them with the same ethnicity. And that's how you don't get in trouble. That's how you don't offend, uh, you know, one faction or one part of your big tent. You know, that's how you keep everybody in the fold. And Brendan Byrne, you know, said, and Brendan Byrne, you know, probably the most quotable governor in New Jersey history. Uh, but Brendan Byrne used to explain his view of diversity. To Brendan Byrne, diversity meant you get an Irish guy in North Jersey, an Irish guy in Central Jersey, and an Irish guy in South Jersey. And that was diverse to Brendan Byrne. So, so anyway, Joey, Joey can, makes the great point, though. You, you know, this is sort of a holistic view when you talk about the legislature and moving the legislature to a more diverse body. You do have to look for sort of almost like a public health holistic point of view. Like, we're, are we moving the entire body, not individual seats? You mean Joey, the the Irish guy from Central Jersey? You, yeah, that's, yes, that's there you go, mean, right. right? Yes, you, Joey, okay, yes. Cool. <laughs> well, this is always fun. We could probably keep going, but uh, who's who's watching? Yeah, well, you know, actually, I'm, I'm looking. We're we're doing we're doing pretty well. We're doing you know, we're we're doing. Okay. There are there are you know. Oh, grim. <laughs> Go to bed. We haven't hit eleven bed. o'clock. No, I mean you, you, you know there are there are more political nerds than ever, and and as somebody who's been a political nerd for you know what will be you know fifty years in a couple months, I mean this is you know never before has it been easier to find people that are interested in, in having these kinds of conversations, and at this deep background, I mean this is this is not what you get from newspapers owned by a company that starts with G or with A. This is, you know, this is what this is what we all like to do, which is we just get into the weeds and really go through things. So I well let me just sneak this across then since we are, but but I just I as a conclusion, if you guys want to, you know, react to this, but I am I'm not seeing you know, we've talked about whether or not the Republicans make can make a play for one or both houses this time around. You know I, Anything can happen. We're going to start with that caveat. I don't see the quality of recruitment that suggests to me that there's a serious play for that at this point. Under the caveat of anything could happen, but you don't see the the, the, the top benchers, the A team coming across in those districts that we said we would need to see. Give us, give me Jaws and we'll talk, right? Well, exactly. I mean, Democrats have had their own recruitment problems. Exactly. In South Jersey particularly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I see this as a, a set of recruits that has a small window of competitive races and a long tail of possibilities. Yeah. That fair enough. You know, you can also see the outcome that we've talked about ad nauseum this year, Joey, which is very, very narrow differences coming out of the general election. This and I'll, you know, yeah. if I can, if, you know, I'll make the, you know, one closing point, which is, you know, everybody should look at this list of candidates and you got a lot of people here who are going to. I'll post win. it on our website soon, by the way. Yes. I should have done that before yes. this live stream, but I'll do that on the website very soon. Joe, you've been great at putting this up every day, and thank you. But but you're going to look at this list, and you're going to go through name after name, and and you're going to see, you know, want you know, a whole lot of people that are going to lose. But you know, take this list, print it out, put it in your desk drawer, and look at it in five years. And look at judge this list of candidates not by how they do in this election, but where they are in the future. You're going to have a lot of councilmen and mayors, people who've gotten involved. You're going to have a lot of people. You're going to have people on here who are sitting in, you know, sitting in black robes uh, on the on the uh, on the bench because they've they've done you know they've stepped up and helped their party. You're going to have people that are you know holding all sorts of appointed positions. So. So that's and thank, and thank God for them today. Thank God for them today, because we would not literally not have elections if they weren't putting their names out there. We would democracy doesn't them. work without all of the right. also rands. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, I think that's a good way to close it. That that you know, sacrificial lambs, heroes of democracy. So thank you, Joey Fox, Micah Rasmussen, and you know, I to, I, I didn't do the plug as much as I'm supposed to. You know what I. You know, Micah Rasmussen, the director of the Rebovich Institute of New Jersey Politics at Ryder University. Well, uh, that's every time nice I write you. your name in a story and I have to write that out, I'm like, oh, yeah. but, <laughs> well, you that's know, nice you're of you. worth it. You're worth it, Micah. <laughs> <laughs> Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill is going to be with us on Tuesday. And there are still a few seats available. If you'd like to come, like, Ryder.edu slash Sherrill. You can register yeah. for your seat. Can I can I can I can I can I can I just give you the preview? 
<laughs> yes. You're, you're going to ask her if she's running for governor in 2025, <laughs> and she is going to say, Micah, I am focused on the issues that are before the U.S. House of Representatives right now. I'm not going to ask her. Sean Cavanaugh, my student's going to ask yes. her. And, and he got the sound bite when, uh, when this new Supreme Court justice, when he asked her the question, and she yeah. said, yes, she would move in order to get around senatorial courtesy. So he got the scoop there. Sean, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the numbers. You know, I'm confident that Sean Kavanaugh is, <laughs> is watching right now. So, so thank you. And, and, but that's, you know, look, this is, you know, this is always fun. And, and you, you two are two of the smartest people I know. So thanks for joining us. Thank you, David. And, and for, everybody, for everybody who's watched this, thank you so much. And for those who uh, uh, those who watch this on a delay, we will uh, hope that everything that we said is still in effect by the time you watch it. So good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.